And we are so excited to start tonight with the women's portion of Who's Number One. These are the best high school wrestlers in America. Spay, you worked hard to put this card together. What kind of action are the fan, should the fans look forward to tonight? We have 10 matchups of some of the best wrestlers in America. Uh, they've all earned their way on here. They have every accolade you could imagine in their trophy cases at home. Uh, 10 matches, all fire, but I want to highlight the final two. It's our co-main and main event as the top seven that's on your screen right now are going to be amazing as well. But when we get towards the end, be on the lookout at 132 pounds. We have a world bronze medalist at the U17 World Championships. Came back home with a medal for the United States of America. It's Haley Jaffe, wrestling out of Pennsylvania, also a Pennsylvania state champ. She's number one. Her challenger, a making her third appearance here at who's number one. Also a Fargo champion this year, the junior level, Cadence Didick, wrestling out of Illinois. And then that's just the lead up to our main event at 106 pounds, perhaps the most credentialed wrestler in high school in America, wrestling out of Sunnyside High School. It's Audrey Jimenez, a three-time age level world medalist and her challenger number two in the country, a two-time California state champ, uh, Naya Falcon out of Walnut High School. And, and we're not, not just, here. Yeah, not just here for uh, great wrestling. We're supporting a great cause. In the wake of the devastating fires in Maui, Flow Sports is donating a minimum of $10,000 to help members of the Flow Wrestling community affected by these fires. We're asking you to join our efforts. Your contribution, no matter what size, will make a significant impact. Share this campaign with your friends, family, and fellow wrestling enthusiasts. Scan the QR code on your screen and donate today. Flow Wrestling's Who's Number One is presented by Cliff Keen, the original wrestling outfitters. Ladies and gentlemen, coming out now, she is a 16U Fargo champion, currently from Michigan, ranked number three, Madison Neuenheis. Kicking things off at 100 pounds, walking out of the mat right now. One of the youngest wrestlers here. She's just turned 15, Madison Neuenheis. And from Indiana, a U-17 World Team member, currently ranked number two, Ryan Murphy! Walking out of the mat right now, that's Rian Murphy from Crown Point High School, Indiana, a U17 world team member. So kicking things off with a superb matchup, 100 pounds, number two, Rian Murphy, number three, Madison Neuenheis. It's world teamer versus Fargo champion. That's going to be a theme, Christian, that we're going to see a lot in these matchups. Yeah, such a credential card. Lots of international experience, national experience. We're going to get started here at 100 pounds. And we are underway. Freestyle action, two three minute periods. In the black is Neuenheis. In the red, Murphy. Right now it's Neuenheis circling to her left. Level changes from Murphy. Losek, nice misdirection single. Coming and attacking the head, now looking to go behind. But in and up on the high crotch is Neuenheis on the edge. Now the zone here. We'll see if there can be any score, but they're going to blow it dead. Great initial exchange. That misdirection was incredible, but Neuenheis was able to get out of it and wind up in an attack. Bro, now another low shot here by Murphy, trying to circle. Same situation. Ends up head outside is Neuenheis. Now looking to lift, lock it through the crotch is Murphy. Nothing yet. Showing no maturity wise beyond her years with that defense. And they'll stalemate it once more. They could probably let that go a little bit. Yeah, great attacks from Murphy, but Neuenheis figuring out a way to get her hips down, doesn't get pulled through on those crotch lifts. And already got a passivity warning. 45 seconds in. Murphy, the more aggressive wrestler so far. She's initiated, but it's been Neuenheis winding up on the high crotch on two occasions. No finish yet. There she ends up on a head inside shot. Now maybe going to try to come out the back door. Looking to lock again is Murphy. Nothing doing. Now trying to double off is Neuenheis. Another stalemate. Another low shot. Can't get in. Nice down block by Neuenheis. Yeah, lots of action to kick off this first match. Both wrestlers going at it, but it's going to be the second 
Uh, passivity warning, so on the clock goes Madison Neuenheis. She's got 30 seconds to score or else Murphy gets the first point of this match. Hand on the mat for Neuenheis. Now she comes up inside control on that right, cleared out now by Murphy, another level change. Both very quick attackers to the leg, and yet again, Neuenheis finds herself on the shot and looking to counter and score the first points of this match is Murphy, nothing yet. So clock working in Murphy's favor. She needs to keep uh, wrestling here. Another whistle. So she's got six seconds on the clock. She can score, and that clock keeps ticking, but Neuenheis, she needs points in the next four seconds, or else it's point over to Murphy. So Murphy will, in fact, take the 1-0 lead with that shot clock point. Given the amount of attacks and scoring opportunities both have had, unlikely that would play a, a too big of a factor. Now, another low shot, and this time trying to take her through. I don't think Nguyenheis exposed, and the officials agreed. White, White paddle across the board. Yep. Now in that draped position, nothing yet. Murphy Nguyen trying to find her way to exposure. Nothing yet. And Nguyenheis using low center of gra gravity. She's fending off those attacks and uh, sitting the corner on those reattacks. Another shot, but well defended once more by Madison Neuenheis. Good level change. The leg attacks from both wrestlers, very, very skillful. And once again, Neuenheis on that right leg, but getting the leg and kind of stopping makes the finish a lot tougher. And we're going to have, I don't know, what the sixth stalemate of the first period. So plenty of attacks, not a lot of points yet. Yeah, we haven't seen those uh, sequences play out that long, so we haven't seen a lot of scrambling. We don't know exactly how far either of these wrestlers can take it in those positions, Another but we'll shot. see here. Now sits her on her butt, but once again, she's kind of bringing her hips in a little too aggressively, and it's in those moments, Neuenheis is able to find herself on that left side attack. So definitely a little adjustment in the, in the finishes, because Murphy gets in on that leg, sets Neuenheis on her butt, but just can't quite get the finishes. That's got to be the point of emphasis from her corner right now. Yeah, you, you, they, they both know what they need to do here. Neuenheis has to find some offense. Her defense is working great. Uh, Murphy needs to figure out a way to finish uh, those shots. She's getting in on legs. She's got to figure out how to finish or counter when Neuenheis goes in on her legs. So 30-second break between periods, and they'll head back out to center. You mentioned those accolades. Uh, Murphy, also a Fargo champ of her own. So both of these folks, both of these girls have been on the main stage of Fargo. They've wrestled in big matches. Now they get to see how they do here. Most of the attacks have, have occurred from space. Not a lot of time in the ties. They're finding themselves in a short offense situation here, potentially, for Murphy. But elbow control by Nolan High slowing things down. We've got a stalemate back to center. 2.42 to go in the second. And no panic from, from uh, Neuenheis when she finds herself in those positions. She's able to defend very well. And now really dictating off that attack is Murphy, but sweeping out of it. Good shot by Neuenheis, but once again finds herself stuck underneath. Pulling that ankle now. So neither wrestler able to finish any of these shots. They've been in, on each other's legs the entire match. The interesting question will be uh, the next passivity warning. Uh, because Murphy, I don't believe, has, has any yet. And you, someone's got to go on the clock next if there are no scores. And they're indicating towards Neuenheis, and it seems like she may go on the clock again. And she is, so 30 more seconds. So sometimes they'll alternate, but Murphy's been uh, aggressive enough and been controlling center well enough to get two straight shot clock points. Yeah, it's rare, but Murphy earned that second passivity, or the third passivity. Head outside attack once again for Neuenheis, extending the position now, trying to get her hips back is Murphy, closer to a score than she's maybe been, but Neuenheis dug in there, trying to step over the ankle is Murphy, getting closer than before, now grabs the toe, trying to take it over, and they're going to go one on the shot clock, no points on a takedown or anything, so they'll go back up, 141 to go here in the second. And these are three-minute periods, so full six-minute matches. Most of these wrestlers are used to the U17 rules, which are two-minute periods. Some have wrestled U20 and seniors, which are three minutes. So this will kind of, we're getting to the point of the match, or we're in the point of the match, where stamina may take over. Yeah, we'll see what tactics change as Murphy fires off probably the 20th leg attack of the match. <laughs> and a great reattack from Neuenheis, and a finish here would put her in the lead yeah. if she can get a takedown. But it's the finishing that's been 
eluding both wrestlers. Now draped here is Murphy, and a slight tip could put her in exposure, but it's Neuenheis who goes down the mat. They're gonna go two red, white paddle to white paddle, no. So no points for, for Murphy there, and I believe that's the right call from the judge and chair. Now trying to finish backside is Neuenheis, but squeezing the head is Murphy, and there's gonna be a takedown. Neuenheis in the lead, 2-2, two, two, 50 seconds to go. Just gutting out that takedown, never saying no, give it, never giving up, reaching, reaching back. back. Whoa, not always advisable, but it cleared the position. Now, once again, looking to run behind, but Neuenheis has been able to be really strong in this head outside position. They'll go back up on their feet, 36 seconds to go. It's Neuenheis in the lead by criteria, by having the bigger uh, point score. Yeah, Murphy's been able to get on her shots, but hasn't finished any yet. No offensive points. 30 seconds. Good down block there. Wait, uh, Madison gets her head in the way. And she finds her way on a leg again. This could be problematic for Murphy, who needs to score. She's got to work hard for this crotch lift. And right now, Neuenheis going completely flat. Could be really tough to get that elevation you need. Now 13 seconds to go. Murphy's going to have probably one more crack at this. She only needs a point. Now it's a shot, and once again, winding up in that single leg, switches to head inside. This is a really tough position for Murphy to count. Now five seconds to go. And that is gonna do it. Madison Neuenheist, the late score, gets it done. Wow, she got that one with the takedown, the only offensive points, but man, Murphy never stopped attacking. Very impressive from both young ladies, but look at the expression on Madison Neuenheist. She's pumped. She won as a 15-year-old here, and who's number one? Yeah, great match from both. Honestly, setting a great tone here with the, the volume of, of attacks from both wrestlers made that really exciting and interesting. It was, it was crazy to see them both get in so many times. And, and the, the positions, if you look back at, at Madison's win, it's getting out of these positions on your butt. Yep. That's a score, 99% of matches. And she was able to avoid all those scores and get two of her own off this extended position. And we're gonna be Coming back up next. With 127 pounds, Taina Fernandez taking on Carly Tesker when we come back. Ladies and gentlemen, now coming out, she is a Fargo finalist from Wisconsin, currently ranked number two, Carly Chesker. And now coming out That's in Carly the Chesker, home town, well, home a state wrestler of Wisconsin's own. Ladies and gentlemen from Maryland, Taina This is a, she was a oh. middle school prodigy. Now she's gonna be a freshman at Archbishop Spalding in Maryland. Taina Fernandez in the red. She is one to watch. She's taken off like a rocket ship. U15 Pan Am gold medalist. While her opponent, very well credentialed, Carly Chesker, runner up at Fargo and a team trials finalist as well. And here we go, we are underway. Second match of the evening. Chesker in the black, Fernandez in the red. Some level changes from both wrestlers to get it started. As Chesker tries to get to a tie. Posting on the head, clearing. So the boys are gonna end up with an all Wisconsin battle uh, later today, but right now we've got the uh, singular Wisconsin native on the women's card. That's Carly Chesker in the black there. Gonna try to take out number one, Fernandez in the red. Underhook on that right side for Chesker. Decent head position, but it's Fernandez able to pressure in. And indicating towards blue. And so it's Chesker getting the first warning. Next one, she'll go on the shot clock. Both of these wrestlers very young. Chesker just finished her freshman year. Fernandez going into her freshman year. She is the youngest wrestler here in all of who's number one. She just turned 14. So she's doing all this stuff that you see in her bio page or when you read about her as a 13 year old, just now a teenager. Nice single leg by Fernandez extending, or at least trying to as Chesker getting her leg all the way back, but continue to fight and circle hard to that left. 
is Fernandez, and now in a much better position to finish. Pops her head to the outside opposite, and she's gonna get two and potentially a leg lace. Let's see. That could be trouble. These are together, that's two more. Middle of the mat, a lot of room could to be work. A potentially match ending situation, but it's Chesker able to fight out of it. Yeah, she needed to do that. That was looking tight, but she fought hard, broke the grip, so she's gonna get more time to wrestle. Down four points to Fernandez. So two and two to get it started. Left side single leg, got it going. They're trying to get him out of the face. And we're back underway. See if Cheskar can get onto her offense. I think we'll see the crowd respond pretty well to that. She goes to the appropriately named Badger High School here in the Badger State. They love the Badgers. There's a sweep single leg by Cheska trying to step behind that leg. It's a shin wizard, looks like, from Fernandez, trying to take that foot out in order to loosen that wizard and free that right arm so she can get the finish. But the Earl stalemate. So we'll go back to a lot of neutral wrestling. But Fernandez putting good pressure on that uh, shoulder of Cheska as she was trying to finish from that single leg. Nice double leg, no defense for that one. Clean Blows right finish. through, that's gonna be 6-0 for Fernandez. And back up, no turn coming, 6-0 with 28 seconds remaining. Popping at the head, there's a high crotch now from Cheska. A finish here would be big. But defending well is Fernandez, and who, how are they gonna score this? Two blue offered, two red, and it, they're gonna go two red, and now Fernandez looking for a fall, potentially, takes her through again. Could be 10-0, we'll see what the score settles at. And they're gonna say 10-0, and that's gonna do it. Kaina Fernandez gets it done. That's, that's what the hype was all about. Taina Fernandez at 10-0 Tech before the first period expired. She's number one, held on to that ranking, and both of those wrestlers are gonna see a lot of again, but Taina Fernandez, there's a reason she is one of the most talked about young talents in America. That is back to the center. That was it, that was the championship. I think Taina didn't know at first, but no challenge coming either, so that scramble late gave her the points that she needed to end the match early. So two matches down already. One nip and tuck, 2-2, two -two, and this one a 10-0 blowout. So we're gonna go into 138 pounds next, our uh, third bout Ladies of the and evening. gentlemen, now coming out, a junior Fargo champion from Wisconsin, currently, Sorry, from Washington, currently ranked number two, Cadence Gerg. Cadence, pink hair, she came here to entertain. She said that before, she's a Fargo champ. Wrestling out of Pacific Northwest. And we're in the red. She is a U-17 World Silver Medalist from Illinois, currently ranked number one, Valerie Hamilton. Number one wrestler at 138 pounds in America, Valerie Hamilton in the red coming out to the mat. We didn't see her a ton this summer, so this will be a great test to see if she's still at the top of her game with a challenger like Cadence Gerg coming for that top spot. We are underway in this match. We got Hamilton in the red, Gerd in the black. And right away, they're hand fighting hard right in the middle of that mat. Underhook on the left side for Gerg. Decent head position there. Fishing for an overhook there is Hamilton, nothing doing. A loud ovation for Hamilton from Illinois, not too far from right here in Kenosha. Now cleared out well by Gerg. Yeah, Hamilton was a runner-up at the Illinois State Championship. She bumped up a weight class to take on Sydney Perry. Now back down at her natural weight at 138. Two on one for Hamilton, posting the head and trying to take her to the mat. Not going to be able to get, get a score out of there. 
Setting the tone, though, she's going to get a passivity warning on Gerg, her first. One thing I've noticed, they're really working to put someone, give, a, give that warning in the first 45 seconds of the match. Sometimes they'll let it go a little bit more, but they're being very consistent with that. They want to see if there's no points going up, they're going to start the, getting the warnings going. Left side underhook for Hamilton, trying to sweep out of it is Gerg, nothing doing. Gerg wrestled her way to this who's number one bout. Wasn't the number two challenger until she ran through a loaded Fargo bracket, taking out all the other contenders on her way to get herself an invite. And Gerg gonna go on the shot clock after that second passivity warning. A nice shot, ends up on the single leg. Shin Wizard here from Hamilton. Trying to beat the wizard, maybe to try to put the leg in is Gerg, but well defended here by Hamilton as she takes that arm out all the way. Looks to slip the near leg in. Whose points? Gotta be Gerg. So they're gonna go four, four confirmed. And Gerg counters the, it looked like a side headlock Merkel situation and takes Hamilton all the way through, feet to back for four points. I like the creativity from Hamilton, looking for a Merkel while standing, but Gerg, too much power. And that was basically a five point move because she was on the clock and she didn't score there in the next. 10 seconds or so, it was going to be one point for Hamilton, but nope, four point move, and it's 4 0 Gerg. Yeah, great point there. Big momentum swing, jumping out to a four point lead, plus the criteria advantage that a four yeah. can give you is huge. And there's another shot from Hamilton. High cross, trying to go crack down now, looking to sit the corner. Maybe it's Gerg looking for a cradle. Now trying to take the head away, but Hamilton dug in there, but the shoulder is beat. Looking to lock the crotch now is Gerg. And now steps and scoops the ankle, maybe, it looks like. Not yet, no, just circling behind, and that's gonna be a stalemated position. Tenacious grip by Hamilton, not letting go there. Gerg was close to scoring, but good work by Hamilton to force a stalemate. A lot of style on the mat, yeah, Gerg's Pink hair, you got Hamilton's mismatched shoes. Yeah, it, it's fun to see the personality come out. Absolutely. And uh, they're here to uh, entertain. That was kind of the main focus of these two wrestlers. There's a shot, and that's going to do it for the first period. They'll head back to their corners. It's a 4 0 lead for Gerg out of Idaho. Yeah, representing uh, Idaho at Fargo, where as mentioned, she took out all the other uh, contenders for this invite here. Uh, while Hamilton uh, won a U-17 World Silver Medal last year in the summer, was very busy uh, at uh, U-17s in Rome. This year we did not see her at team trials or uh, Fargo, but she is healthy and ready to go now, so we're glad to see her compete again. Second period now underway. Oh, a little misdirect goes left to right, but Hamilton able to catch it. Front headlock position now stepping around, going one way, then the other, taking her through, at least trying to. And that should be red. No, they're gonna go two blue and two red. I'm curious how they're gonna end up scoring this. 6-0, so it looks like they went two blue. Interesting. And now, boom, that should be two red. And now trying to step over, a potential pin situation. Can she come around? She's got the head and arm. This is a big problem for Gurr. Can she fight? Trying to step over. She still got that half in. Can she circle all the way around? Out of the danger for now is Gurr. But can she circle back? And they'll come back to their feet after a near pin situation for Hamilton. That yeah, was close. That was very close. Uh, credit to Gurr for fighting off. Hamilton had that extremely tight and do we need an injury time Hamilton looks like she might have gotten her bell rung a little bit corner needs to call for it if I don't think you can challenge a pinfall call no I'm not sure what they're talking about they, they should have they if they wanted a brick it should have probably been that flurry before before where they went it really felt like there should have been something there because she initiated that, the move, and wound up exposing Gerg out of it. 
I think for, for Hamilton, probably two and two at the worst. But if you don't throw the brick, no take backs. Yeah, that was um, you know well past the uh, that sequence was over. And then we went to this sequence we're seeing on the um, replay, that lat whip. Some Action continues it. there, though. And that is where Hamilton had Gerg fighting for her life. Um, if, a, if a fall had been called there, it has to be confirmed by uh, the chairperson or table judge and um, was not confirmed. But if it had been, I don't know if you... I would not have been too surprised there. So the coach has a question. I'm not sure what they could look at. It. They if are they go all the way back, that would be... Not according well, to the... Yeah. Not, not super... Not officially official. Yeah. And Hamilton seems needs like to, she's not doing great. She needs to take a minute, and maybe that's what the brick is for, is to get some extra time. It's a, it's a lot to be out in the center of the mat uh, with all the, the lights on. And then to come so close uh, to get that pin and Here's end the match. Here's that initial... Oh no, that's the. That's the second one. where. Uh, I'd like to see before that. You see Hamilton sink that reverse half, and that really put Gerg in trouble there as she spent some more time in that position. Yeah, that exchange prior is, is what is probably, if they're looking at something, I would assume it's that. That was a little more of a difficult call to make. That was a pretty straightforward two pointer there. Yeah, well, in parterre, so only two. Let's see if Hamilton is collected now. And the brick's right. going back, so maybe they called off the brick. Well, I don't know what that was. But six to two with two minutes and eight seconds. All right, here we go, back underway. Two minutes to go here. Hamilton down four, and two takedowns won't do it. She's gonna need a four pointer if she wants to tie it up. Yeah, that's where that four take points the earlier. Take the lead. Now we're in an over-under position. We'll see if either athlete initiates. It's Hamilton. Looks like she's going to threaten over-under body lock, but thinks better of it. Good head position there for Hamilton. She drops in on a single leg sprawl from Gerg. Now double unders, but head in the way there, preventing progress for Hamilton. One twenty-six to go. And they were locked up ear to ear in that tie. That was blown dead, so they get a fresh start in neutral. And elbow off attempt there by Gerg. Nothing, nothing doing as she takes an underhook on that left side. Drops her head low. And they're gonna hit Gerg, attention kind of blocking off there. He has to keep the head up. Can't bury it in there and just try to chew up the clock, although that is a tactic she'd be looking to do. Two on one attempt there, but Gerg able to defend. 55 seconds to go. Hamilton going left side club to the right side of underhook, but has not been able to initiate offense off of that. Maybe until now trying to throw it by. Can she at least get two for her efforts? Pretty much a 50-50 position here, honestly with Gerg over the leg now, and near leg in, can she take a three throw to Merkel? That's gonna be two. Potential pain situation. Gerg's in big trouble here. She's got the head, can she fight her elbow through? Taking her back over once more, and oh my goodness, Gerg survives again. Roller coaster. Six for the score. Hamilton's gonna need three more points. Yeah, two is not gonna do it despite putting Gerg on her back twice and making Gerg fight for her life. It's that four point move in the first period that's gonna be the difference maker. And so close on two occasions now with 10 seconds to go. She's gotta be thinking feet to back here. Underhook on that left side for Gerg, slowing things down. And that's how this one's gonna end. A too little too late on that throw from Hamilton. This could be a six four win for Outs Gerg of Idaho. Outstanding bout. Both wrestlers left it all on the mat. Gerg, this is our first number two over a number one. So a lot to be proud of from both competitors, but Gerg with the four-point move. And then she got 
the advantage in that key scramble in the first that we... Ladies and gentlemen, your winner from Washington, Cadence Guard! Man, that's one where if they wrestle it again, she figures out one of those pinning situations. It's very different, but it's Gerg right here. This was really the difference maker. Countering that near leg in and going feet to back. That got the job done. Yep, six points is what it took. Hamilton so close though. As you said, I agree. Run it back, we might get a different result. And who's number one is presented by Defense Soap. Now the official soap and body wipe of Flow Wrestling. Protecting you for over 15 years. Defend what you have built with Defense Soap. Fargo champion from Maryland, currently ranked number two, Nabby Sarni. Coming out to the mat, it's not often a three-time Fargo champ is going to be a challenger to the top spot, but that's Nebby Sarni from Montgomery Village, Maryland. And yes, you won juniors last year and 16U the two years before that. And now, coming out, she is a U-17 World Team member from Georgia, currently ranked number one, May Parado! And how do you get that number one ranking? A big way to do it is to make the U-17 World Team. Everybody in the same bracket, and you come out on top, you get that one number one ranking, which May Prado did. She's a senior at Lassiter High School, Georgia, in the red. All right, underway, May Prado taking on Nebby Sarni. Sarni in the black, Prado in the red. Level changes from Prado getting this thing started. Pulling right to a single leg, but well defended by Prado. Underhook on that right side, but Prado had good head position. Collar tie, but cleared out by Sarni. Front headlock here. Oh, nice little shuck by. Goes one way, then the other, left to right. And that's going to be a two-point takedown for Sarni to get this started. And working hard on that gut on the left side. Steps over. And going to be defended by Prado. And they'll go back up on their feet. 2.16 to go in the first. Yeah, that was their first takedown before a passivity point went on. So good aggressiveness from Sarni setting the tone in this 144 pound bout. And there's an elbow off to a shot from Sarni. Now a single leg by Prado. Switches to the other side, now on the edge. Haven't seen a step out yet. Yes. And now a level change there from Sarni. Now pops head outside, close to two, not yet. And there it is, another takedown for Nebby Sarni. And a 4-0 lead, 148 to go. And yes. the challenger setting a tone early with a 4-0 lead. Yeah, Sarni got that last takedown by not going out of bounds and circling in. It's good mat awareness, good savviness, and she is rewarded now with a 4-0 lead. Forehead to forehead they go. 90 seconds remaining in this first period, two three-minute periods. A freestyle action left side for Prado with that underhook. Had her towards the zone, but Sarni does a good job circling back in. Now she's got a front headlock looking to snap. Now an over-under position. Looking to drag left side. Sarni just throwing a lot of different attacks and ties at Prado. Yeah, lots of motion. The hands have been in Prado's face the whole time. And head to leg there, and another takedown for Sarni, 6-0. Love Firmly in control now, yeah, absolutely. Back up they go. Sarni just so happens to be from the same county in Maryland as Helen Marula, so that's quite a role model to follow. Yeah, no question about that. There's a shot from Sarni now looking to get her first points, or Prado, and she is going to score on that counterattack, and now she's working on the gut left side. Parterre can be such a huge difference maker in freestyle. I've not seen a turn yet in freestyle from Parterre. Or we saw one lace, that's right. 
No guts at this point. Yep, Taina had that. And uh, good job, Prado, not panicking, going down 6-0. to zero. Uh, But now battles back 6-2, to two, very much still in this. 22 seconds to go in the first period. Well to go here, see if either athlete works for a late score, two on one for Sarni. But way out to the other side, gonna be tough to score. She drops, now looking for a go behind late. Can she get the elbow down? Oh my goodness, so close, but not quite. That would have been absolutely huge to get that two at the end, but not quite. But that's the second time she's been able to get that kind of counter score, left side, go behind position, so. Plenty of hope for Prado in this final three minutes. Yeah, that she wasn't able to steal a takedown late in that uh, short time, but uh, you know maybe a confidence booster knowing that she can get to those positions. Uh, just needs a little bit more time to finish. As she's getting instruction in her corner, Sarni out to the center first, and we'll get another three minutes. So far, pretty action-packed, yep. enjoying this bout. Underway now in the second period between Sarni and Prado. Prado trying to keep that wrist, but loses it. Back to the two-on-one there, but now clear it out again. And they're going to get on for that kind of headbutt, forehead-to-forehead contact from Sarni. Yeah, she's been very physical this bout. Hands, head. Been keeping Prado off of her offense for most of it, but Prado now on the attack. Prado working from that underhook. She had her hips all the way in, trying to use it. And there's this go behind position left. Can she get it? She's close. And there's two more. So Prado has found an absolute vulnerability. And she's exploited it twice now and is just down by two. And a takedown would, or a turn here would put her in the lead, 6 6. Back up on their feet they go. And now it's really, you feel like the momentum shifting a little bit for Prado. We're starting to enter those extra two minutes that they may not be used to wrestling. Six-minute bouts, U17 are four-minute bouts. We'll see how much stamina comes into play. A little overtie attempt there, nothing doing though. Knocks it off. Probably look for a drag to that left side. Takedown here for Sarni would be so big. Give her that little extra breathing room. Those two point leads can be so fleeting in freestyle wrestling. Yeah, with all two point scores, two more will give Prada the lead. Two on one here for Sarni, now cleared out. And Prado kind of forced this underhook position and ends up Giving up the two, kind of really was fishing for like almost like an underhook and gives gives up an easy, easy kind of throw by for Sarni. Now it's four to eight. She trails Sarni, extending her lead back to four. Yeah, that's that breathing room that you were mentioning earlier. So now Sarni, you don't want to relax, you don't want to stop wrestling, but maybe you're not as tight anymore. You're not as anxious yeah. knowing that Prado needs a, a feet to back or two scores here. Still a good amount of time, 45 seconds. Yeah, a lot can absolutely change in 45 seconds. Sorry, doing a good job clearing elbows. Whenever Prado puts that collar tie on. Now looking slide by, but not there. She goes back to that underhook. And now ducks under it. That was beautiful from Sarni. 10-4, maybe ices it here. Now she working on a trap arm, maybe. Loses it, 10-4 the score with 15 to go. You said it, I think that was the icer. Uh, that's what Sardi needed. Beautiful duck under, clutch takedown, and now six points in 10 seconds. Gonna be tough for Prado. Sardi doing a good job hanging on to wrist. She's gonna attack again, underhook on that right side. And that's how this one's gonna end. 10-4 win for Nebi Sarni. 
She came here number two. She's going to leave number one in America at 144 pounds. Yeah, excellent bout again, but we have for the second time in a row, number two, Sarni! To the mats here at UW Parkside, getting her hand raised, getting it done for the state of Maryland. Couple highlights on the screen. There were a lot to choose from. Lots of scoring, 16 points, all takedowns. Yeah. So Prado showing there was no quit in her in that match, but it was Nebby Sarni with the icer there, the duck under. And we're going up next to 164 pounds. Number two, Naomi Simon out of Iowa taking on uh, Alexandria Alley out of Ohio. That's coming up next. Where well, the athletes are getting loose, ready, preparing for the matches right here. The campus UW Parkside, great host, great location. So excited to be here. And excited to kick off the second half of the card here. Yeah, top notch facilities here at Parkside, and now we've got 164. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now coming out. A Fargo finalist from Ohio, currently ranked number three, Alexandria Alley. That's Alexandria Alley walking out to the mat right now, just started competing at the Erie Sports Center with her coach, coach Chad Vandiver. She's a Fargo runner up and a team trials runner up. And now coming out. She is a junior Fargo champion from Iowa, currently ranked number two, Naomi Simon. And number two in the nation, Naomi Simon from Iowa, coached by Lee Fullhart. She is a Fargo junior champ this year and an Iowa state champion, just sanctioned Iowa, uh, just sanctioned girls wrestling in Iowa. All right, here we go, underway in the red. That's Simon taking on in the black alley out of Ohio. Now it's on hook on that left side for Simon. Cleared out now a collar tie here. Now on hook on the other side. Great hand fighting early on from Naomi Simon. Yeah, you can see what her strategy is. Upper body, go right at alley, see if you can make something happen. Underhook on that left side for Alley. Now cleared out, head position. And they're gonna have a passivity warning against Alexandria Alley. And more forward pressure from Naomi Simon. And now looking to go behind is Simon, close to two and going to get it, two and maybe more. They're going to say four. Feet to back. Wasn't down in parterre yet, they say. And another gut going to make this six. Oh, and the fall from a gut wrench. Wow. Naomi Simon with the first fall of the evening. Got the pin off the gut. Came here to get it done in a hurry, and there it is. She went feet to back. Got the two and then got the fall, Naomi Simon out of Iowa. Dominant Iowa. win from Naomi. Naomi Simon! Yeah, that was a great gut wrench and you don't normally see pins from gut wrenches because you're when you're so locked around the waist there, it's sort of hard to get held there. Normally it's something you roll through. She was tight in there. She goes from one side to the other, goes left side, does a good job running her feet, and then right here, Allie just kind of hang, I don't. Yeah, she didn't realize she was in the danger. She was until it was too late. Simon gets the fall, so that is 164 pounds. We're past the halfway point. Coming up next, 112 pounds, Claire Bowie, number one, and Gabriela Gomez, number three. Ladies and gentlemen, now coming out, wearing the black, 
She is a U-17 world silver medalist from Illinois, Gabriella Gomez. That's Gabriella Gomez. She's been at Fargo before. She won last year. And now out on the mat, number three in the nation. And wearing the red from Florida, she is a junior national champion. Currently ranked number one, Claire Bowie. And that's number one, Claire Bowie, walking out onto the mat, wrestling out of Wyoming Seminary by way of Florida. She's a Fargo champ, ran the gauntlet through a loaded 112 pound junior bracket in North Dakota. And underway, 112 pounds. It's Gomez in the black, Bowie in the red. Collar tie right away from Bowie. Wrap tie there for a moment for Gomez cleared out. Both these wrestlers are who's number one vets. Both have wins as well. Gomez over Solario last year and Bowie over Bragg. And uh, front headlock here for Bowie. Looks like she might be trying to lock her hands. Now underhook on that right side. Gomez fighting out of it. Now double unders here for Claire Bowie. But a good job by Gomez fighting out of that position. But she is going to get warned for passivity. First warning. Next one, she will go on the shot clock. There's an underhook on that right side for Claire Bowie. Doing a great job controlling center as Bowie. Yeah, she's dictating the action here. And now taking her to the edge is Bowie. Can she get one? That's going to be the call here for Red Offered. Nope, switch to four blue. What's going to be the call? One red. How are we settling this? Okay, we got a brick. They need to stop. So four blue officially is what went up. And it seemed like it might be Gomez's four. However, if she stepped out first, mm -hmm. she can't score offensively there. So we'll get a good look at this and be able to see where she stepped and when the action was initiated. Hard underhook hasn't stepped out, hasn't stepped out. Still in. So this should be one red because her right foot stepped out prior. Yeah, yeah and the whistle initially initially said four red, but then checked himself, said four blue. Uh, the uh, table judge right in front of the action said one red for Bowie, and then the chairman did four blue, which would give Gomez the four, which is why it's on the board. But Bowie's corner challenged. That's Cornell Robinson, the Wyoming Sem. I believe he's the director now. He's in charge of both boys and girls programs at the uh, prep school with the uh, powerhouse programs in both genders in Eastern PA. And a familiar face in Gomez's corner, Austin Gomez. Yep. Who's number one alum. That's one a of a definite fan favorites in college wrestling. Had a great career at Iowa State and Wisconsin. Now he's at the Cliff Keen Wrestling Club up in Michigan. Reunited with coach Kevin Jackson. Again, we're going to get another look at this. And we're going to get the ruling here. Oh, they're, wow, they're called four blue. Okay. I guess they call continuation is the only thing I can think of. Um, so That's just not my understanding of it, but four blue plus one on the lost challenge going to make it 5-0 for Gomez. Or not? Or yes. Here we go. And back underway. Oh, nice little slide by attempt there. Oh, double leg for Gomez. Stepping around. That's going to be two more for Gabriela Gomez. 7 0 oh, the lead now. Gomez, I think, smells blood in the water. She wants to end this early with a 7 0 lead. 
two scores or a four-pointer will do it. Yeah, it seems like she's got even more confidence than before. Because it was really Bowie that was dictating a lot and even driving Gomez around on the edge and it was that counter score, that big four. Really blew this wide open, now 7-0 lead for Gomez. Yeah, Boo's got to forget about all those points and just wrestle her match now, not panic, as you see her get back to what she was doing earlier, which is move Gomez around the mat. A nice shot by Gomez, timed it perfectly. Ends up with a standing single, fighting the hands is Claire Bowie, but Gomez in a definite position of advantage here to get a takedown. And looking to step behind, but a good job by Bowie getting her foot to the mat. Yeah, nice defense from Bowie. She really didn't want those points on the board. It would have made it 9-0 if she gave up a takedown. So still 7-0, 20 seconds in the period. And now Bowie coming in with that underhook. She knows she's got to be a little more aggressive here, try to find her way to some points. Seven points is a pretty substantial deficit, but certainly we've seen bigger comebacks here at who's number one. And time's going to run out. 7-0 for Gomez. Yeah, that's about as good a period as you could hope for from Gomez. Uh, she's looking for a little uh, bit of redemption as both of these wrestlers were in the same Fargo bracket. They did not meet. Gomez lost uh, in the, uh, I believe it was quarterfinals. Uh, wrestled back for third, outplaced the wrestler that beat her. Um, and so Bowie and Gomez didn't hit. Bowie went on, of course, to win that bracket, earn that number one ranking. Uh, but Gomez says she wants number one, and she can earn it here. She's well on her way, now second period underway. Good stutter fakes there from Gomez. We'll see if she pulls the trigger on another leg attack. She's fired off two really nice attacks so far. But it's Bowie has been adamant about getting to this underhook position but not been able to convert it to any points so far. As she drops down to the single from the underhook. You see that from time to time, but no score still. A shot attempt there from Gomez. Now front headlock for Gomez after the level change by Claire Bowie. Underhook right side for Bowie. Tries to step that foot in, but basically hands it to Gomez, who looks to score, but Bowie puts her foot back on the mat. Wow, they're going back and forth. It's furious out there. Bowie looking for a home run, which she's going to need with a seven-point deficit, but so far, no scores in this period after a minute. Oh, slide by for Gomez. Can she get it? Circling, but a good job squaring up by Bowie. Forcing that underhook down, preventing Gomez from scoring another two. And for Bowie, you got to start thinking feet to back or a pinning combination. If you have one in your arsenal, now's the time to start breaking it out. We're coming up on 90 seconds to go. And she trails 7-0. Fresh start, but like you said, Bowie either needs to really start chipping away and, and racking up the points or needs a home run ball to end this bout early. Oh, nice slide by again. Can't get it, though. Certainly not lacking in physicality either, this bout. Not at all. Oh, headlock attempt. They're going to give her the slip there. Yep, so reward offensive risky behavior. If you slip off, back to neutral, no harm, no foul. There's that slide by again, but once again, Bowie able to defend. Yeah, the recovery time on Bowie is impressive. She's getting herself in precarious situations, but recovering most of the time. First period, though. That's where the damage was done. And now just 37 seconds to go. There you go, attention blue. They want to see Gomez stay a little more engaged, not block off quite as much, but she can afford to do so with just 33 seconds to go and a 7-0 lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now there's a single leg from Bowie, well defended by Gomez. And trying to fight him with that underhook and 
They're, they're going to stop and they're going to go caution and one here. Gomez. Loses the shutout, but of minor importance right now. So 7 1 now after that caution and one. 13 seconds remaining. No hand fight in the middle of the mat here. Front headlock position potentially for Gomez, but on their feet, and that's how this one's gonna finish. 7-1 for Gomez. And Gomez says, I'm number one. And she did it again two years in a row. Gabriela Ladies Gomez go is winner from Illinois, Gabriela Gomez. New number one coming at 112 pounds, very deep weight class nationally. There's, there's the two scores that Gomez got. And she's your champ. Who's number one is sponsored by Dolomer, the official mat of Flow Sports. All Flow Wrestling events, including tonight, will be wrestled on Dolomer mats, the undisputed leader in sports surfaces. Coming up next at 117 pounds, number one versus number two, it's Carly Brooks from Valiant Prep, Arizona, and Bella Marie Gonzalez from Clovis High School in California. Ladies and gentlemen, now coming out wearing the black, she is a U15 Pan Am Gold medalist from California, Bella Marie Gonzalez! California, a very talented young lady. She was a Pan Am gold medalist at the U15 level, Bella Marie Gonzalez, just a junior from Clovis High School. And wearing the red, she is a U17 world team member. She is from Arizona, currently ranked number one, Carly Brooks. And that is the number one ranked wrestler walking out of the mat at 117, deep weight class, Carly Brooks from Valiant Prep in Arizona. She just got done wrestling at the U17 World Championships where she placed fifth in Istanbul, Turkey. And we are underway. Gonzalez in the black, Brooks in the red. This is a rematch. These two have seen each other four times over the last year or so. It's been Brooks has won three of them, but they've all been tight. Very close matches. Underhook on that left side for Brooks. A lot of time spitting the underhooks this afternoon session. Cleared out of it, drops down to the leg. Nothing doing though. Coming up with a seatbelt. But no score in there for Gonzalez. Gonzalez tries to snap. Brooks down to the mat, can't get it. Stalemated, 219 to go in the first period. Yeah, these next four matches, it's all downhill sledding. It's gonna be a lot of fun as we race through these final matches. Excited for this one. Brooks at Valley and Prep coached by Angel Cejudo there. And they're looking for a go behind. Nice job by Brooks. She's gonna jump out to a 2-0 lead. See if she can get going from the top position. Reaching back there is Gonzalez. Not typically advisable, but for the time being, gets her out of a, a jam in parterre, and they'll go back up to their feet. First score by Brooks off of the initial action from Gonzalez, 2-0. Fighting hits, there's a low shot there by Gonzalez, but a good sprawl by Brooks. Gets her out of danger for the time being. Now locking around the chest is, is uh, Brooks. They're back up on their feet. Gonzalez looking for an opportunistic score there. Just kind of snatched up a leg as it presented itself to her. Stalemated back to neutral. And a front headlock position. Look at short drag. Can't get it though. Looked like Brooks was maybe close, but couldn't quite get the angle. 
Now head pinch there. Can she get it? She had their hips all the way in. Now it's Brooks looking to counter Gonzalez's head pinch. That was close. That was tight. It was tight, but well defended there by Brooks. She stepped over the leg, and she's going to get two. And Brooks jumps out to a 4-0 lead after a pair of takedowns. And trying to get to work on a leg lace, but well defended by Gonzalez. Yeah, helping Brooks finish that takedown. It looked to me like she was going for a, a leg elevator down on the ground. And Gonzalez had to bail, give up the two. And now Brooks with a four-point lead late here in the first period. Gonzalez initiating uh, the tie up there. But that's going to do it for the first. Brooks takes a 4 0 lead into the break off a pair of takedowns. Yeah, so far, these uh, familiar foes, it's been Gonzalez with the answer for, or no, Brooks, I should say, with the answer for Gonzalez's attacks. She scored off counters. Um, but uh, both very uh, seasoned and credentialed wrestlers, so do not count Gonzalez out. Uh, she gets her instruction from her corner. She's a Cali State champ and single class California, very deep in uh, girls wrestling. That's quite an accomplishment. Period break ends and second period now underway between Brooks and Gonzalez. Gonzalez could try to turn it around after giving up a pair of takedowns in the opening set. Two on one for Gonzalez, but doesn't have the necessary head position to convert this to a score yet. Keeping that wrist, now switching back to almost a head pinch now, maybe head in the hole. Oh, reaches across, dresser dump type of situation, but no, cleared out, and it's Brooks that has the elbow. Hey, good action stalemate there. I love the variety of attacks we're seeing, keeping us on our toes and each other. And it looked like Gonzalez might be able to get that cross ankle from that head in the hole position, but Brooks able to defend. One way, then the other. They come up head position. Now it's Gonzalez getting head position on the left side, but it's the underhook from Brooks. Now shallow and cleared out. 154 to go in the second period. Yeah, those championship minutes now. Final two minutes, we'll see how the stamina holds up. Sweep single there, not able to connect with the leg. A nice looking attack though. Stale made it 135 to go in the second. Gonzalez needs to find her way to a score. Really like these flurries though. Shows a lot of maturity, a lot of skill, even though no points are being scored. The fact that they're wrestling through these positions and getting stalemates, it's still impressive. Back to the underhook. Fighting for wrist control and now they'll blow that dead. Official saying, keep your hands out of the face. They'll get back to action. Aggressive in the hand fight there by Gonzalez. She knows she needs to score now. Final minute. Nice sweep single there. Can she get the finish? It's Gonzalez whizzering hard. But Brooks in good position. She drops down to the foot momentarily, but it'll get stalemated. 49 to go. Rounded the final minute, Brooks in command. Four point lead, but Gonzalez definitely not out of it. Almost had the angle on the, just looked like a pass by, but Gonzalez able to evade. Oh, nice shot again. Once again, it's a whizzer from Gonzalez slowing things down. And she looks for a cutback, that should be four. Four goes up, Gonzalez takes the lead, four, four, incredible. Clutch counter, needed those four. She's got the lead by criteria, under 20 seconds now. Just a textbook cutback off that single leg counter. 
Brooks looks back at her corner, knows she now needs a point. She is trailing by criteria because of one four beats two twos. And turning up the intensity, nice single leg by Gonzalez. Brooks looking to counter it, three seconds to go. And that's how this one's gonna end, the late cutback. Gives Gonzalez a 4-4 victory. Ice in her veins. Bella Marie Gonzalez now takes the series three to two. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner from California, Bella Marie Gonzalez! Takedowns to nothing as we are serenaded with some of Metallica's finest <laughs> solos. Let's see some of those moves again. There's some of the takedowns that got it going for Brooks, put her in the lead. Gonzalez attacked the entire match. Yes, she Brooks did. scored on two counters. Is this it? And great position here on that shit where they're both reached in, and that is a clear four feet to back sequence. And that was the difference. Yeah, I told you we're going to be speeding through these bouts, and now we have 122 pounds. That's coming up next. Number one, Everest Lidecker, her challenger. Number two, Aubrey Crazer. It's going to be a good one. Where in the black? She is a junior Fargo champion, currently ranked number two from the state of Pennsylvania, Aubrey Kaiser. All right, straight out of Easton, Pennsylvania. A junior, it's Aubrey Kaiser, number two in the nation. One Fargo wrestled her way into this bout. And from Arizona, she is a U-17 World Team member, currently ranked number one, Everest Lidecker! Number one, that's Everest Lidecker trying to go back to back. Who number, who's number one champ, or who's number one victories? She beat Cadence Didick, who's wrestling next. Last year, she's just a sophomore from Desert wow. Visa High School in Arizona. And we are underway, Lidecker versus Crazer. Crazer in the black, Lidecker in the red. We're already in our third to last match. And we got some doozies coming up, including great. this one. Yeah, great level changes there from, from Crazer. See if she can create an opening off of those as they're now tied up. Looks like the position that Lidecker's most comfortable in, wrestling from those ties. Trying to clear out of that underhook is Crazer, trying to fight it down. And that'll be the first passivity warning going against Crazer. Yeah, Lidecker using her leverage early. Long frame. Shot attempt there, shallow penetration for Crazer. And there's a single leg attempt there. Now it goes the other way with the pick from the underhook. Outstanding attack. And Lidecker up 2-0, but she's got her eyes on Moore. She might have a lace. Has that foot all the way over the hip, but an insane fight here by Aubrey Crazer. And they're gonna blow that dead, and man, that is huge. I mean, that position, yeah. and that's one thing about the, the girls in freestyle. They can fight out of some parterre positions that, that wouldn't, aren't even thinkable. Uh, yeah, it's so true. Freestyle. You, see, you see the legs all tangled up there and the fight that Crazer was able to do while her body was twisted in half. It's impressive. But it's Lidecker that scores first. She had the underhook on one side and dropped to the pick opposite ankle. And there's a shot, no real setup there by Crazer. She finds herself a little bit extended, trying to get her hands locked. Almost had that pulled in, but instead Crazer finds herself extended, pulling on that ankle now. Good go behind mechanics here by Lidecker. She's gotta beat that right arm though. It's gonna be tough until she can block that to run behind, but now she's getting closer. Just the arm to beat. Circling, circling, and staying on the ankle, but they're gonna go out of bounds. They're gonna stay grounded, so no points. 
two offered by the judge, but white paddle by the chair. Yeah, more great fight from Crazier. Yes. Lidecker, though, very methodical, going through the positions, close to a takedown there. We'll see if she can wear down on Crazier, if she can, or if Crazier can come back here with some offense of her own. And two on one there for Lidecker. Strong position. Can she? Curious if she's looking to throw it by or convert it. Looked like she just tried to pull her down to the mat. But Crazier, Crazier able to fight out of it. Now they're all square right in the middle of the mat. 12 seconds to go in the first. Just a 2-0 lead for Everest Lidecker. And a shot by Plaza, very extended once again. And once again, looking for that ankle. One second and just saved <laughs> by the bell is Aubrey Crazer. Avoids giving up another takedown. Instead, it's just going to be a 2-0 lead for Everest Lidecker as we head to the second. Yeah, that was uh, a display of grittiness from Crazer throughout that first period. Lidecker just seemed to be uh, just precision attacks and precision positioning to keep the pressure on. Uh, very close a couple times to extending that lead, but just a two-point uh, margin at the moment as we finish this uh, break period. A classic matchup here. We see it a lot. Lidecker, world team member, Crazer, Fargo champ. Those are the big tournaments you want to win if you want to get these top rankings. Second period now underway between Lidecker and Crazer. A good level change again from Crazer. Brief underhook there for Lidecker. Shallow now. Elbow control on that left side for Crazer. Circling around the mat, trying to avoid going into the zone is Aubrey Crazer. And closer to the edge still, and they'll go passivity against Crazer. She's going to go on the shot clock. So she'll have 30 seconds to score or sure. She'll go down 3-0 to Everest Lidecker. And yeah, that's a testament to Lidecker's offense. Usually when you have the lead in the second, Oof. the other person, or you're going to go on the clock, but not this time. And another shot, and we'll see if Lidecker can complete this go-behind position. She's circling hard, and there she is. 4-0, and the shot clock will continue to run, so she could potentially be up 5-0 after this exchange as she drops down below the waist for a potential leg lace. The next point goes up, 5-0 on the score now, 143 to go in the second. Yeah, Lidecker just being uh, oppressive in her offense and wearing Crazer down. Got that one and plus the shot clock point. So big 5-0 lead, a four-pointer is not gonna do it. No one else is oppressive as this heat, Andrew. <laughs> We yes. left Texas, promised better weather, and it's like the hottest day, hottest weekend in Wisconsin all year. We brought the heat with us. That's okay. We're accustomed. That's what we've been training all summer for. And there's a shot from Crazer reattack. Nice job by Lidecker. Nearly had the angle. Now has Crazer in the zone, and nothing yet. And that should be one on the step out, extending her lead to 6-0. Is Everest Lidecker? Yeah, she's coming at Crazer like a Terminator. Just no relent, no let up, no room to breathe for Crazer. Because she is fighting hard. Yeah, not for lack of trying or attempts from Crazer. But Lidecker's had all the answers so far. 50 seconds remaining. Lidecker really burst onto the scene uh, a little over a year ago. She won her Fargo uh, bracket to get herself an invite to who's number one last year, and then hasn't really looked back. I don't know when the last time she's lost domestically. Same shot for Crazer in the same go-behind situation with Lidecker trying to run to her left. She's got the ankle. She's trying to drag. Switches to the other side. Crazer does a good job of getting that arm up and slowing things down. And Crazel are able to print and now pulls it in, head outside. Nice job by Aubrey Crazel. She hooks the elbow, hops over. They're going to go two blue. A nifty little score at the end. Going to be a, a little late, though. 
6-2 final, Everest Lidecker, number one at 122 pounds. Yep. Winner from Arizona, Everest Lidecker! Heroic effort, fighting to the bitter end, gets the two points, so no shutout, a moral victory, but Lidecker, no doubt about it, she's number one, 6-2 victory at 122 pounds. And that underhook to the ankle pick, one of the nicest scores we've seen this afternoon. And there was that great fight on that lace, but the go-behind position, it was Crazer's attacks to Lidecker's go-behinds that were really the story of the second period. Yeah, very impressive. Scored first and then kept the pressure on, making Crazer take shots that Lidecker was able to score on. Next, we got 132 pounds already, our penultimate bout. Number one, Haley Jaffe out of Pennsylvania, taking on number two, Cadence Didick, wrestling out of Illinois. That's next. Ladies and gentlemen, wearing the black from Illinois, a two-time Fargo National Champion, currently ranked number two, Cadence Didick. Candace Didick walking out right now. This is her third who's number one. That's a record for the women. Wow. She is one and one trying to get on the plus side of that all-time record. She won Fargo to earn her bid to this event. And wearing the red from Pennsylvania, a U-17 world bronze medalist, currently ranked number one, Haley Jaffe. From Pennsylvania, the senior Haley Jaffe, she is a world bronze medalist. Just uh, a month or so, or so ago in August in Turkey, Haley Jaffe won a bronze medal for the US of A. So she is number one, challenger Didik at number two. All right, underway between Jaffe and Didik. Didik in the black, Jaffe in the red. And they're hand fighting in the middle of the mat. Sweep single leg by Jaffe. Comes up, nice finish there. Goes her head to the outside, the opposite hip, I should say, and gets the two. Great opening attack and finish there. As Haley Jaffe gonna set the tone. She'll go two on one on that right side is Jaffe. Now cleared out, sweep single now. And now coming up around the body is Didik. Close, but man, Jaffe somehow able to evade. Didik was in really strong position there to score, couldn't get it. Yeah, I like how Didik came back, went right back at Jaffe, shook off that takedown. And we got a, we got a nice battle going on here. Yep, two great exchanges thus far. High crotch now from Didik, sitting to the corner though is Jaffe. Locking around the crotch, trying to counter score here. Didik probably in the position of advantage, but Jaffe looks very comfortable in this position. That leg is straight, but now coming around, whoa, stalemated. He saw Didik trying to elevate over that uh, top leg to get uh, a step over. Jaffe did a good job stopping that, and we get a stalemate, still 2-0. Another shot. Low shot, trying to come around, well defended by Jaffe, and Didik using her length well. She didn't have a, really a, a fancy setup there, just dove in underneath and used her length to get her hand on that ankle, but no score. Yeah, they're throwing haymakers here in the first period, back and forth. I don't know how Jaffe got out of that last shot, but hip highs turned and faced, and here we are. Another shot attempt, nothing there though. High crotch, not there though. Re-attack by Didik. Good sprawl there by Jaffe. Looking to run behind. She's in great position now. Can she get it? Drops down to the leg for the finish. Unconventional, but she finds her way to two more. 4-0 lead now for Haley Jaffe. Love the pace from Jaffe. Non-stop chain wrestling, putting moves together, and yeah, not maybe a textbook finish, but if it gets the job done, you go with it.
fight and risk there in the middle of the mat, 20 seconds remaining. Inside control there for Didick, and that'll be how the first period ends. 4-0 lead for Haley Jaffe. Didick got a little bit of work to do as we head to the second. Yeah, we'll see if Didick can uh, get back on her offense. This is a, um, I believe they've met before. And uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a rematch of the U-17 uh, World Team Trials where Jaffe uh, made the team over Didick. But you know, a lot of, little bit of time has passed. Didick's been nothing but uh, doing good work since then. Right now, though, Jaffe, thanks to a impressive pace, holds this 4-0 lead. There's a great leg attack and a quick finish for Fiddick. What a start to the second period. She absolutely disappeared on that single. No fight, no option for Jaffe to counter that. Yeah, did it exactly what she needed to start the second period. Two-point move puts her in the lead via criteria. A lot of wrestling to go. And now Jaffe going to get a single of her own. Good head pressure as she goes around and gets two more. What an answer by Haley Jaffe. Yeah, you heard the crowd in favor of Didick there. She's from Illinois, the Chicago area, which is not a far drive, but Jaffe took the crowd out of it with that last That's shot. Time. Again, now looking to maybe run behind as Didick can't do it. Cadence did it. You're doing anything you can to get back to that same single leg. Yeah, the setups are going to be key here. Jaffe very strong with the counters and in, in position here in the center of the mat. And you see Jaffe's lead and hard with that right leg. It was the left leg that Didick was able to attack. And now she'll drop under his Jaffe, but they come up with the underhook momentarily, countered out. Now they're cleared, wrestling from space. Minute 42 to go. Oh! Sits to that from that drag position. Now, short offense here for Jaffe. Holding onto the wrist is Didick. And she's got to keep circling and squaring. Not going to be able to fight it off. And Jaffe now up 8 to 2. 125 to go now in the second period. Yeah, that, that puts some distance between Jaffe and Didick on the scoreboard. And with just 80 seconds to go, Didick is going to need to figure out some offense in a hurry. Elbow control there for Didick. This is a little bit more wrestling than they've used to. All their previous matches have been four minute matches. We're into the sixth minute just now. Final minute of this bout, our co-main event of the evening. And it's Haley Jaffe and with an 8-2 lead. Another shot attempt by Didick, but good down block by Jaffe. Keeping Didick off of her legs. Sweep single, not there though. Didick comes up with some hooks, 24 to go. Time running out on Didick. Jaffe needs to hold on for 15 more. Eleven seconds to go now. Jaffe's done what she needs to do, and she may add two more before this period ends, before the match ends. And there she does, a 10-2 winner. Haley Jaffe leaves absolutely no doubt. Impressive stuff from number one. Haley Jaffe defends her Ladies race. and gentlemen, your winner from Pennsylvania, Haley Jaffe! And yeah, no doubt about it, you said it. The senior, rising senior from Kennett High School, Pennsylvania. She's a world bronze medalist for a reason. She is number one at 132 pounds. One more to go, Spay. Yeah, we are ripping through these matches. Just one more, and it's a big one, 106 pounds. 
as we watch the final replays here. And of course, at 6.30 p.m. Central, 7.30 Eastern, we're gonna get going with the boys portion of Who's Number One. Of course, Flow Wrestling Who's Number One is presented by Cliff Keen, the original wrestling outfitters. Thank you to Cliff Keen for sponsoring this event. Coming up next, it's 106 pounds. It's Audrey Jimenez, three-time world medalist, number one for a reason, Anaya Falcon from California, two-time state champ. She's your challenger. And that is our last bout coming up next. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now coming out way in the black, she is a two-time California state champion. This is your second ranked Anaya Falcon! That's Anaya Falcon taking the mat in the black two-time Cali State champ from Walnut High School. The brackets that she went through in California are filled with ranked wrestlers. That's how she got her bid. And wearing the red from Arizona, a three-time world medalist Currently ranked number one, ladies and gentlemen, Audrey Hamanez. She's ranked number one, pound for pound, and at 106 pounds. You remember, you may remember her from such hits as the U17 World Championships and the U20 World Championships, uh, where she has won medals in the last three tournaments from Sunnyside High School. Audrey Jimenez in the red. Final match underway, Audrey Jimenez. In the red, taking on Anaya Falcon in the black. Jimenez, one of the best wrestlers of the evening, as she's looking to finish the evening number one. As you see a drag counter there from Jimenez. One Sunny open. side high school, same as Roman Bravo Young. Nice snap there by Audrey, a U.S. Open champion, senior level. This is someone who very likely at some point gonna be wrestling on the biggest stages of wrestling. Well on her way here for her age level. And for Anaya Falcon, absolutely nothing to lose here as the number two ranked wrestler taking on the very game, Audrey Jimenez. Yeah, Falcon said earlier she's game for this bout. She knows that uh, Jimenez is gonna be the favorite and the headliner for a reason. But as you saw, she came right out and tried to take it to Jimenez early, and Jimenez got a one-point step out, out of it, but you know, we got a bout here. Good job pulling down to the mat by Audrey Jimenez. Looking at, whoa, hopping over his Falcon, but Jimenez ready, what an exchange, and it's Jimenez who throws that half, this is deep. Can Falcon fight it off? It looks like she may, but Audrey is not giving up this half Nelson, but they're fighting it off finally. Is Anaya Falcon now dropping down to the leg lace? Could be trouble here. Falcon trying to free herself, but Jimenez is just looking to score and to score and to score. But yeah. so far, just a 3 0 lead for Audrey Jimenez. Head hunting by Jimenez going right for that half. That was in deep. That was impressive by Falcon throwing her body the opposite direction, trying to break that grip and see what she can oh, do wow. now. Near leg in, it's the attack from Falcon, but Jimenez. Pops that near leg in, takes it out, runs behind. 5-0, now working on a leg lace. Can she get it? Knees look like they're together, hands through. Two more, 7-0, two more turns would end it. Knees are together, 9-0, she's a turn away. Can she do it? And that's it. 11-0, Audrey Jimenez with an exclamation point, Spay. Yeah, that's why she is the headliner at 106, no doubt about it. Winner. From Arizona, Audrey Hamanez! She needed, Falcon was doing everything she can, going kitchen sink, throwing her body this way all over the place, trying to make that match last, but Jimenez would not be denied. And then those uh, turns from the leg lace, that was impressive. There you're seeing that score, that initial one from Audrey Jimenez. Did a fantastic job scoring, scoring. She countered, she initiated, she got turns. And Audrey 
really cementing herself as the class of, of women's high school wrestling right now with this victory space. Yeah, uh, kudos to Anaya Falcon for going out there Absolutely. and being game. Uh, Audrey Jimenez, like you said, a U.S. Open champion. She's in Final X. She's trying to make world teams. I have a feeling she'll be making world teams in a very short amount of time. So that's going to do it for the women's portion of Who's Number One. Another fantastic afternoon of wrestling. And I don't know what time. It's 5.39 here in Wisconsin. So in about 50 minutes, we're going to get going with the, with the men's portion. But Spay, give us a recap. What were the highlights for you from this women's Who's Number One? Great bouts, great energy, uh, great energy from the crowd. But the two techs were, stood out to me, Tanaya. Uh, her name, Fernandez got a 10 -0 text. She's just a freshman. She's 14 years old. Beat Crazy. the number two challenger. And then what we just saw in Audrey Jimenez, a 10 -0 tech to uh, cap off the evening. But great uh, performances up and down. I thought 117 Brooks and Gonzalez was awesome too. Yep, a fantastic evening of events. We're going to take a look at some of the best action from this afternoon. Incredible job there. And we appreciate you guys so much for tuning in. So. Grab a quick snack if you get a, if you get a chance. And you're going to get your first look here at the NCAA, the new NCAA rules. We're going to do seven-minute matches. You're going to see a three-point takedown. You're going to see all that getting started at 7.30 Eastern. But first, let's take a look at some of the highlights from this women's Who's Number One 2023. Yeah, uh, all the girls brought it, every single person on the mat. Uh, they wrestled their guts out just to get here and then laid it out all on the mat. You saw back and forth matches. You saw some dominant performances as well. Uh, we got a couple pins uh, from wrestlers, a couple techs. Uh, there was that big high flying move from Gabriela Gomez, who's now a two time, who's number one uh, champion. And uh, yeah, can't say enough about the efforts that you saw here. We get to do it all over again with the boys. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll see you soon. With the boys, who's number one? Starting 50 minutes. Welcome back to UW Parkside's D. Simone Arena here in Kenosha, Wisconsin, for the 2023 Who's Number One presented by Cliff Clean. Tonight, you'll see the top high school wrestlers in the country competing to answer that all important question who's number one? We're so thankful to be here at UW Parkside, a school and community that absolutely loves the sport of wrestling. Alongside David Bray, I'm Christian Piles, and David, you work hard to put this card together. What kind of action are the fans in store for tonight? We have 10 incredible high school matches under an NCAA rule set. We've got the best in the country. Most of these matches, number one versus number two to decide the top spot in the country. You're gonna see the matches on your screen in just a second, and we're gonna kick this thing off with Angelo Ferrari coming back to who's number one. He is the number one man in the country since last year, taking on Ty Ice to Colorado. Then we got a PIAA Finals rematch, Colin Rath, Pearson Manville, Will Hinkle, Joe Seeley. After that, that's a Blair Wyoming Seminary grudge match. It's a rematch. Mm -hmm. I mean, just look at the rest of the card. These matches are incredible. And the final three matches, we got Daniel Zapata, Bo Bassett, a match a lot of people are excited about. And then two matches between really good friends and training partners from New Jersey, Anthony Knox, Leo DeLuca. And then this crowd is going to be on its feet for the final match between Sinclair and Mirasola. And of course, we're gonna have the NCA, the new NCA rules on display tonight. Seven minute matches, three point takedowns. You're gonna see it all tonight. I cannot wait to see how some of these calls go, how, how the NCA rules could potentially impact the winners and losers of this match. Of course, we're gonna have some great wrestling tonight. No doubt about that, David, but we're also doing this for a great cause. In the wake of the devastating fires in Maui, Flow Sports is donating a minimum of $10,000 to help members of the wrestling community affected by these fires. And we're asking you to join our efforts. Your contribution, no matter what size, will make an impact. Share this campaign with your friends, family, and fellow wrestling enthusiasts. Take the time right now, scan the QR code on your screen and donate today. And we're gonna check in. Um, we're gonna get this thing started with 170 pounds, David. As soon as uh, we're ready to go here, it's gonna be Angelo Ferrari versus Ty Ice out of Colorado. But before that, reminder, Flow Wrestling's Who's Number One is presented to you by Cliff Keen, the original wrestling outfitters. Thanks as always to Cliff Keen for their support in the sport of wrestling. And you'll see all the wrestlers tonight competing in that super sick Cliff Keen gear. Coming up next, 170 pounds, Angela Ferrari and Ty Ice. Oh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to UW Parkside and the De Simone Arena in Kenosha, Wisconsin for the 2023 Flow Wrestling's Who's Number One, presented by Cliff Keen. This afternoon, we are featuring the top high school girls and boys throughout the country to find out who truly is number one. Ladies and gentlemen, coming out wearing the green is a Super 32 and Iron Man medalist and Cheesehead champion from the state of Colorado, currently ranked number two. Let's give it up for Ty Ice. There you see Ty Ice out of Colorado coming to the mat. Gonna have his hands full with number one Angela Ferrari, but what an incredible opportunity for Ty Ice. Yeah, this is a guy that's put together a really nice sophomore year last year, now entering his junior year, an opportunity to make a huge statement against Angelo Ferrari, who's been number one for an entire year. And we're in the red, a two-time Ironman champion, and who's number one winner from the state of Texas, currently ranked number one, Angelo Ferrari! That Eminem walkout song once again for Angelo Ferrari. And uh, last time he was in a four-man, this time just one match. He's trying to be number one in the time span of seven minutes. He became number one a year ago at Who's Number One. He's held on to it ever since. Trying to stay on top is Angelo Ferrari. Ferrari, of course, an Iowa commit. Made a big splash with his announcement. Ty Ice just starting the recruiting process, still uncommitted. Handshake, and we are underway in the red. That's Angelo Ferrari in the black tie ice out of Colorado. Hard club there from ice. Ferrari, so many different ways to score. He's got a plethora of attacks, and then defensively, just almost impossible to take down. Hand on the map for Angelo so far. Remember, this is folk style of NCAA rules. The new NCAA rules on display. Neutral danger zone, three-point takedown, three-point near fall, all of it you're going to see tonight. Collar tie for Angelo Ferrari, 225, remaining in this first period. And seven minutes, definitely an adjustment for these wrestlers. None of them have been in matches of this length for regulation. Yeah, and you know, adjustments from a lot of the NCAA rules, a three-point takedown. Curious when we'll see the first one of those here, who's number one. And Angelo kind of alerting the ref to the fingers. And they break it up. Don't want to see the interlocking fingers. Ferrari wrestles out of Melissa, Texas. Not a ton of national competition throughout the year, but a two-time Ironman champ, and of course, got the win last year at who's number one. There's a shot. Nice single leg attempt there, but good down block by Ty Ice. Castle Rock, Colorado, same hometown as Malik Heinzelman, Ohio State wrestler, 125 pounder. Ferrari complaining that Ice led with the head, and that was a really hard hand fight of nothing else there. Popping at the head is Ty Ice with that left hand. During his interview yesterday, Ferrari said that he's been trying to work on improving his scramble game, which was already at an extremely high level. See if that comes into play. Yeah, I would have credited the, the scrambling for his win at who's number one a year ago. Some of his counter scores off of leg attacks on full display. So far hasn't got the opportunity to show it. No one really gotten to a leg at this point. A minute 10 in. A lot of times you describe a wrestler as either explosive or a scrambler. He's got both. Very calculated start here. One less than a minute to go. I know Ferrari has a lot of confidence in his counter offense and his mat wrestling, so he may be thinking that Ice needs to bring the match to him. Possibly. He's been trying to get that underhook on the right side pretty consistently, not been able to get a good hand fighting from Ty Ice. Ice bringing a yeah, physical hand fight, as you mentioned. Ferrari with that last snap 
really hard, creating some motion, but hasn't tried to blast through one of those openings yet. Now just 12 seconds to go. See if anyone tries to steal a takedown right at the end. Ferrari very much control and center. But and we may have to wait another period for that first three-point takedown. Curious how the mat game comes into play. Ice looks like he's bleeding. He's also going to have choice. And they may take care of the blood before he gets to choose. Ferrari so has he has turns on top. I'm curious if Ice is going to go underneath here or if he'll defer. Different schools of thought, you know. Some people say get the first point and have that advantage for for overtime, and that's not as much of a factor with, you know, two-minute sudden victory and all the other things in front. And there, Ice for sure jumped the gun, trying to get a jump, respecting the top game of it, Angelo Ferrari, and he's going to get one caution. Claw on that right side for Angelo. Ferrari with a crazy wingspan, and you see him getting that spiral ride. Out on his toes, tried to jump side, not able to do so. Ferrari committed to Iowa, and over in his corner, his, his father, and also Alex Marinelli. Four-time Big Ten champ for the Hawks. Riding really tough with the claw so far. He's bleeding again as Ty Ice, so he'll get himself a restart. He's got to get cleaned up. I don't think we had any blood time in the in the women's card. Now, first match we got, got doubles of the nosebleeds. We got blood. We need a little coagulation to go on yeah. here. That's what we're hoping for. I'm looking up to my right and seeing a whole bunch of Division I coaches in the yeah. house. Uh, Iowa, really excited about Ferrari, and I believe we have close to a full coaching staff in attendance for yeah. Ferrari. Yes, I see Coach Brand straight across from us as we have a restart here. Ice up to his feet, and he gets away. Only 45 seconds of riding time. So that's big for Ice to avoid giving up that riding time, and most importantly, not giving up a turn. Shot there, attempt from Ty Ice, can't get in, front headlock now. And now it's Ferrari dropping down to the leg and an attack, head inside shot. Now turning, kicking out of bounds and not gonna get the two on the edge here. What? Oh, there it is, wow, they called it and, and Ferrari had collected that ankle but definitely didn't bring him to a hip. I would be surprised if we don't see a challenge here out of Ice's corner. Whoa, okay. Maybe not. And there, that wingspan you mentioned Coming into a play there as he's able to track down that far ankle. I didn't think he had it. I'd love to get another look at that one too. And 3 1, mentioned the counter offense of Ferrari. Ice took that shot. He backed out immediately, felt the danger. Ferrari able to capitalize anyway. So, three point takedown for Angelo Ferrari. So, he takes a two point lead now. His riding time over a minute and climbing. That's huge. Nose plug of ice on the mat. We'll see if blood time comes into effect, but Ferrari now pulling that wrist out, trying to break ice down. 13 to go in the second period. 10 seconds to go in the second period. Ice could really use it, an escape here. He's also gonna need another nose plug. Blood all over his arm and Ferrari's. And we'll have a little more blood time at the period break as it'll be Ferrari's choice as we head to the third period. It'll take a 3-1 advantage into the third period. Ferrari so far not scoring a lot of points, but also not conceding any position. And you see that tough ride on top, getting out of the side, creates a ton of pressure running, those, running on those toes. Nose plug in for Ice. He's wrestled a lot of this match really well, but man, just any little position and Ferrari can capitalize. Hey, 
and his defensive position is, is what gonna make him a really tough wrestler at the next level right away. Someone that can make a potentially a transition to wrestle as a true freshman. His brother wrestled as a true freshman, was the NCAA champion for Oklahoma State. And Angelo gonna go under to start the third period. And now it's Ty Ice with a claw ride of his own. Looking for hand control there, but grabbing that wrist. Good job by Ty Ice so far, but now looking to seal off is Angelo, but staying behind the arms now, kicking him free. 4-1 gonna be the lead for Angelo Ferrari. So not only that, but 118 riding time advantage for Ferrari, so could potentially still earn that riding time point. Ice gonna need to open up, but remember, down by three, he can tie this with a takedown in 18 seconds of riding time. Collar and a wrist, stutter fake there by Angelo Ferrari. Ty Ice down to his last minute here. Got to start getting some combinations going, firing off an attack. Unlikely Fer Ferrari's gonna beat himself. He's gonna have to go and take it. Ice tested the waters on a single leg attempt in the second period. And look at this, now Angelo runs the underhook to a single. Kicks out. And they're gonna have a stall warning against Ice. Probably well deserved there when you kick out of bounds like that. Well deserved, but also, what do you have to lose if your Ice kick out and get a fresh start? Yes. 40 seconds to go. Good level change from Angelo. Five left. Ball is in Ice's court right now. And nice sweep single. Shin Wizard from Ty Ice coming up to his feet now is Angelo Ferrari. 15 seconds to go. Can he shut the door here on this match with a second takedown of the bout? Eight seconds to go. Trying to slip that boot in Mayu, but going leg inside. Now close to two. Could Ty Ice get the counter takedown? And they're gonna go three at the end, and then two reversal. I at and least the reversal I think happened after the whistle had blown. Either way, there's a riding time point. Angelo Ferrari's gonna win this match. The question is, what will be the score? Final score should be Angelo Ferrari the winner, regardless. There's nothing really to they're looking at it, but I don't know why because with the riding time point, even if yeah, you want to get the score right. So I guess for the record, yeah. But yeah, looking up to that coach's area, I see uh, a familiar face in new clothes, Rob Cole in his UNC polo and hat with Tony Ramos, the newly named head coach at UNC, Rob Cole, back to his alma mater, University of North Carolina. A lot of schools represented up there. I see. Yeah, I see Chris Bono, John Reeder, Joe Dubuque, Jared Hot, Tom Brands. It's kind of dark up there, so I can't see them all. So. Enoch Francois up there, Brian oh, yeah. Smith, Dom Bradley. There's a lot more, but yeah, you're right. It is, it is dark. On review, no take down. So no takedown, so it's gonna be a 5-1, or 4-1 final. For Angelo. Winner from Texas, Angelo Ferrari! Congrats to Angelo. Ferrari, he had to look around for the camera before he found the flex. Yeah, that's important. What's the point, if you're gonna flex, what's the point without a camera? Yeah. So let's take a look at some of the action. There's that counter attack Ferrari used to get that takedown on the edge. I still, I still yeah. am not certain that was two or three. Pardon me. Yeah, kind of, kind of wild. Good job by Ice competing here to the very end. I don't know if that's two either. That near leg end position gives officials a lot of tough tough calls, but regardless of what that was going to be, Angelo is going to be your winner, and he takes the first match here. We're going to be back with 145 pounds, Colin Rath.
versus Pearson Manville. Are they really? No. Can't challenge the re-challenge. It's like triple stamping a double stamp. You just can't do it. Totally prohibited. Up 145 pounds coming up soon. Coming out in the black, he is a Fargo All-American. He is from Pennsylvania, currently ranked number two, Pearson Manville. Look at this, Pearson Manville giving the high fives. And if you see a halo headgear at an elite wrestling event, there's a pretty good chance it's a Manville. 99.9% .9 Manville. From Pennsylvania, wearing the red, he is a Pennsylvania State Champion, currently ranked number one, ladies and gentlemen, Colin Rath! Here's Colin Rath coming to the mat, PIAA Champion last year, and his finals victory came against this very opponent, Pearson Manville. They've wrestled three times in the last year and change. It's a two matches to one lead for Colin Rath. All right, underway, 145 pounds in the black. That's Pearson Manville in the red. Colin Rath, both Pennsylvania guys, as Bray already mentioned, two on one, classic Manville tie up there. They love that Russian tie. Looking to run to a lay close to it, man. It's a lot more furious pace than the last bout started with. Crazy pace off the whistle, and these two guys train at an extremely high level. Colin Rath trains with Chance Marsteller at Stellar Train, Pearson Manville at M2 with David Taylor. A couple of world teamers as coaches, not bad. David, a world and Olympic champion. Rath on the edge now. Changes the mat. Nice little drag attempt. Man, Pearson looks fired up so far. He has been right in the recent matches with Rath. And I know he believes he's, he's really close to flipping the script. Pearson committed to be a Sun Devil at Arizona State, wrestled for Coach Zeke Jones. Rath's still uncommitted at this point. I'm sure there's a lot of coaches around the country that would love to have Rath on their team. Probably some of them are standing right up there. 100%. And Got an article on our site about his recruiting process so far. You can check that out. Manville with a finger to the face. Shakes it off, but uh, they're just going to get a quick restart. Handshake, and we're back underway. Two PA guys, Colin Rath, Bethlehem Catholic, and Pierce Manville wrestles for State College High School. Over under position. You figure the over-under ties probably favor Pearson. The Wrath not going to be unfamiliar in any position. Pearson dropping that shoulder, driving Wrath off the edge. And different out-of-bounds rules than high school. Wrath needs to make an effort to circle back in, can't back straight out. And so far, I think he's given the necessary effort. He tried to level change out of it. Tipping to circle back in, but Pearson not letting him. They're going to stalemate. Good stalemate call by the officials. They head back to center. Manville really showing himself in this hand fight. Looks good so far. He's taking some some risks, but nothing that's too crazy to avoid. You know, giving up points. Goes one way, then the other. Looked like he was going to get a wrist control, but Manville comes over with an underhook on the right side. The head buried for Wrath. 
Manville hard snap to bury that head. The hand fight against Manville looks like not much fun. None whatsoever. Pearson's got him towards the edge once again. After that opening 15 seconds, things subdued a little bit, a little more calculated and reserved from both athletes. 12 seconds to go. See who pushes for that first period takedown. And we're not gonna see it. We'll head to the coin flip. Not at it, zero. Gonna be Rast choice. Coin goes red. He's gonna go under to get it started. Curious how much of a factor the mat will be in this match. There was a match at Escape the Rock where Rath was able to get a takedown and then ride Pearson Manville for a long period of time to end the period on top. Riding time obviously not a factor in high school, but it is here and Manville made some adjustments in their state finals match, so it may not be a factor, but pay attention to that. Lift and a tip at Granby there from Rath, not gonna get it and Pearson gonna kind of pick him up and they go out of bounds. Eight seconds of riding time accumulated so far. A lot of effort by Manville there to stay in the top position. Matt return, pulling him off the mat. And now a claw ride almost. Got the turn, was able to pull him in the basket there, but nothing doing. Rath able to recover, but now Manville's got that ankle hooked and elevated. Manville creating a ton of pressure on top. He almost got that right leg in, and now Rath up to this quad pod. And another lift, and they're out on the edge out of bounds. And Manville very, very strategic there on the edge. When he comes to his feet, he's kind of picking him up and pulling him back. Gives him a fresh restart and makes Rath have to go start, essentially start over. If 33 seconds of riding time for Pearson. If you're a Rath fan, you probably feel like Manville was stalling or pulling out of bounds, but that's the kind of NCAA tactics you see a lot at the next level. And now wheel bearing him towards the edge, another oh. out of bounds. So Rath's working hard, but Manville's got the answer so far. One of those matches where Manville, if he gets this riding time point, he's gonna earn it five seconds at a time, one second at a time. Shane Sparks is absolutely loving this. This is a Sparks classic. Ooh, little switch attempt there, creating a little action, but they're on their edge. It went, dropped down to the wrist, did Manville. Then single leg out of pounds, like Bray said, five seconds at a time, one return at a time. 54 seconds of riding time for Pearson Manville. Reset, still 106 to go. Both guys expending a lot of energy in these last 54 seconds. Once again, back to that kind of switch position, but chopping that arm is Pearson Manville, and he has Rath completely flattened out. Ankle trapped again. It's a great ride from Pearson Manville, and maybe all his returns and finishes taking a little bit out of Rath. Now he's got the leg in. Manville's been hunting for that leg throughout the period, hasn't been able to get it. Now he has it, but gets a little high, and Rath in decent position. Once again, he fires that switch, creates a little momentum. And they're gonna go out of bounds once again. And once again, Pearson Manville gonna start from the top position. He's 30 seconds away from a huge ride out. How many more times do you think we go out of bounds this period? Ooh, 30 seconds. I'll say two. Rath fires up to his feet. Dropping down to the leg is Pearson Manville. And look and switch, and they're out of bounds, but they're gonna continue to wrestle here on the edge. Big return there for Manville, keeping his toe in. He's gonna stay here as long as he possibly can, and there they go, out of bounds, 13 seconds left. Rath collects himself, looks at that clock. Manville covers left side. 
Back to that claw, can he get a turn here? Nothing doing, now back up to his feet is Colin Rath, they go out of bounds, and there's that second out of bounds. Two seconds left. Final 30 seconds. And it's been a war of attrition here for, for Pearson Manville. 10 seconds here, 15 seconds there, but he's gonna very likely go into the third period with two minutes of riding time. And mission accomplished for the second period for Pearson, but he's gotta go under now. He's gotta pass the same test that Rath couldn't. And this is where that three point takedown could be huge. Obviously two minutes of wrestling to go, so who knows, but normally you get the escape, you have the riding time point, you can give up a takedown and go to OT, not anymore. Not anymore, and that makes me wonder how hard do we see Rath work for that riding time point, or is, do you even really consider eliminating that entire riding time, wasting you know, a minute and change, or do you just kick him now and say, hey, I got two minutes to get a takedown. Right now, looks like he's committed to ride. Has ridden Manville successfully in the past, and Manville back up to his feet. And now Pearson gonna get the escape, so 142 of riding time for Pearson. He's got a 1-0 lead on the scoreboard with the escape, plus potentially riding time. For Colin Rath, Still just a takedown away from taking the lead here outright. Rath flurry of clubs there and Manville slows the hand fight down, ties him up. And now they go out of bounds. Pearson kind of circles away with their real action call. That could have gone either way. Yes, it could have. Your Rath's corner, you've probably been thinking you're close to a couple of stall calls this match. Rath's gotta, gotta start looking to generate. Can't count on some edge stall call to put him back in the match. He's gonna need to fire off some attacks. And right now, the, the first job is, is getting through this hand fight at Pearson Manville. Manville's always been such a hand fighter, but a mistake here, a mistake there has been the difference between him win winning on a big stage like this and right now, he's not leaving any opening for Rath. And Rath fires, can't get it. Now looking two on one is Pearson Manville, nothing doing. But eating up a lot of clock is Pearson now, just 20 seconds to go in this one. There's a shot from Colin Rath, re-attack Pearson Manville. He's got an answer, look at the roll, and out of bounds. And the crowd loved it, they're waiting for it. That's what they came here to see. Yeah, this place wants that type of exchange. We got 16 seconds to see if we get another one. Rath fighting over under here. And they go out of bounds. What's gonna be the call here? Back out, stall warning against Pearson. Not a big deal, honestly. With six seconds left, even if he gives up a stall point, he'll still be leading by riding time. Riding time is locked. Effectively a 2-0 lead for Pearson. Manville looking duck. It's Colin Rath, two seconds to go, and Pearson Manville's gonna do it. Escape in riding time. Pearson Manville's number one. Ladies and gentlemen, your he said two. No, winner! Said, I'm number one. And he did it. Congratulations From to Pearson Manville. He's been so close Pearson. on this type of stage so many times, and now gets the job done. He's number one. Congrats to Pearson Manville. Don't always get to win pretty. Sometimes you gotta grind them out. Good show of respect between those two Pennsylvania hammers. And so we got, already have our first new number one. Yes sir, the Pearson Manville. Take a look at some of this action and a lot of it was in the second period with Colin Rath trying to get away, trying to get away. But wasn't able to do so, and that was the difference in the match. The ride from Pearson Manville. Manville sold out on top. He sold out for that escape on bottom, and man, that counter attack was really nice as they went out of bounds. Wish that would have happened a little closer to the center. Yeah, beautiful exchange. All right, coming up next, 160 pounds. It's Will Hinkle and Joe Seely.
Ladies and gentlemen, coming out wearing the black, here's a U-17 world champion from the state of Pennsylvania, currently ranked number two. Let's give it up for Joe Seeley. Here's Joe Seeley, and uh, I believe he's walking out to, a, to a, bar, a Barbie song. He was pretty excited about that. Well, you would know that. Of course I know that. That's because he told me. And wearing the red, he is a Fargo champion from New Jersey, currently ranked number one, ladies and gentlemen, William Hanko. Blair Academy for Hinkle and Wyoming Sim for Seeley. This is a rivalry match on a couple of levels. Obviously, Blair Sim is a big deal, but a rematch. Will Hinkle earned that number one spot. He beat Joe Seeley earlier this year at U20 Trials. Underway, 160 pounds in the black. That's Joe Seeley taking on Will Hinkle in the red. As Bray mentioned, Blair versus Sim. To the premier high schools, prep schools in America. Joe Seeley, his second appearance at who's number one. He was in that 160 pound four man last year. Won his first match against Nico Ruiz and then fell to Angelo Ferrari in the final. Hinkle, part of one of three brother sister combos at who's number one. His sister Sarah competed here last year. Over collar for Seeley. And one thing that it typically sticks out with Joe is his attack rate. Fires a lot, has a lot of different attacks to both sides. There's a low shot, doubles off, quick finish, and there's three for Joe Seeley getting it started. Seeley can scramble, but he didn't need to there. Really nice low level attack and finish. And if their last match was any indication, I don't think we're done with the scoring. Their last one was nine to six for Hinkle. And quick escape for Hinkle makes it three to one. Definitely a tone setting takedown for Joe Seeley, but gonna need seven minutes of offense likely to take out Will Hinkle. Seeley committed to Penn State. You know, Nittany Lion fans have a lot to be excited about with him. And Hinkle just beginning his junior year, still in the early stages, yet to take his official visits. Good job by Seeley, taking some ground here against Hinkle. Another low shot, same shot. Now diving over is Hinkle trying to counter score. Locked between the legs there, but Seeley's still in a decent position. And remember, there's neutral danger zone here, so that three count could start if Hinkle ends up in exposure. Nothing doing yet, and Hinkle's still in decent position with that reverse lock around the leg. But Seeley trying to work through. Now rolling through is Hinkle. Fun scramble here, 34 seconds to go in the first period. This is the best position Hinkle's been in, looking for a stalemate, most likely. Now, weird finishing position. Now, he's got that foot, has it shelved on his hip. This is a much better position. Oh, wow. Good balance by Seeley so far, and you're seeing his flexibility as well. But it's a great position. If, if Hinkle can finish this at the end of the period, that would be huge. Seeley fighting with everything he can. Now on that foot bouncing, just two seconds to go. And Seeley gonna fight it off. A great attack, it was initiated by Seeley, the low level shot, good counter scramble from Hinkle. Had himself in position on that single leg, but couldn't get the finish. We'll go into the second period, 3-1 lead for Joe Seeley. Seeley gonna go bottom. After Hinkle passed that leg, I really thought he was just hunting for a stalemate, but improved his position and nearly finished. Very savvy in that exchange as Seeley's gonna start the second underneath. Quad pods now up to his feet. Is Joe Seeley looking for to fight hands? He turns cuts and is up 4-1 after that escape. Riding time only at seven seconds in Seeley's favor. As Seeley hit that quad pod, you saw Hinkle reach down for the leg and the count start. That's a new rule. You can't reach down for the ankle from any position. It's not just a drop down rule anymore. 
Sweep single there by Joe Seeley, but defended by Will Hinkle. Shot attempt there by Joe Seeley. See if Hinkle looks to pull the trigger a little bit more this period. Hinkle moves really well when he wants to. Saw him in the room a couple nights ago, and this guy can he can really flow. See if he pulls the trigger on an attack. Collar ties free. He's 44 seconds to go in the second. Seeley likes to use those fakes, get his opponents off balance, unsure when he's coming. And then firing, there he fires there. Seeley in the early stages of his high school career, maybe a higher attack rate, but also a higher mistake rate. And positionally, I think a little more solid than we've seen him in the past. Seely won a Cadet World title just after his sophomore season of high school. Very impressive feat. As we go to the third period, Hinkle going to be going underneath. He's in a bit of a hole down 4-1. Escape here would start the third period the right way. Riding time, just seven seconds for Seely, and he doesn't look real committed to this ride. And quick stand up and out, 4-2. And now a shot right away from Hinkle, standing single, climbing the rope there, getting a little bit higher. He's got that, a good lock around the foot there. Should have that secured, but look at Seeley fighting back into him. He's gonna make him earn this three-point takedown. Back standing again. Hinkle smart to take his time here, not rushing. You could tell Seeley would love for this to come. Oh, loses it. Good job by Seeley kicking out. Hinkle thought about centering up, but instead approaches him on the edge. And now 120 to go. Hinkle kind of lunged at Seeley there. Seeley, little peek out attempt. And man, great little exchange on the edge. So Seeley really showing his defense as well in this match. There's two times he's been bouncing on one foot in a single leg, and Hinkle has come up empty on both occasions. Gonna have to finish if you're Will Hinkle, if you wanna beat someone as good as Joe Seeley. And with a three-point takedown, a finish would be enough for Hinkle. Just one takedown, and right out would give him the win. There's a little double leg attempt. There's a shot from Seeley, but well defended by Hinkle, who's coming on to the last 40 seconds of regulation. Another shot from Joe Seeley. Not gonna quit attacking despite being in the lead. Have to love to see that tactic. Underhook right side for Hinkle as he brings Seeley towards the edge. Throws it by, but not really. It's Seeley able to clear and square up on the edge. Tactical placement here from Seeley. Great job squaring up and staying in bounds, avoiding a stall call. 10 seconds to go. Six seconds to go. And trying to run them, they'll get one restart, but only two seconds to go. I don't think Hinkle's left himself enough time. And he'll fire, and time should expire, but it's not running. There we go, match over, 4-2 win for Joe Seeley. Joe Seeley holds up a, a pretty lackadaisical number one. He's, uh, he's not gonna celebrate too much. This guy, he treats every match like it's just another one. Pretty subdued guy, Joe Seeley, but on the mat, he's absolutely undeniable. And now he's number one in the country, and this takedown is why. Low level shot, doubles off. Great head position on that finish. And it was enough to get the necessary takedown for the 4-2 win. Just seeing that final flurry on the edge of the mat. Reminder that Who's Number One is presented by Defense Soap, which is now 
the official soap and body wipe of Flow Wrestling, protecting you for over 15 years. Defend what you have built. Coming up next, we've got 113 pounds. It's Christian Castillo. He's taking on Paul Kenny in a number one versus number one matchup. Love it. From New Jersey, here's a U17 world champion, currently ranked number one, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Kenny! All right, here comes Paul Kenny. He's a U17 world champ this year. He has yet to set foot in a high school classroom. But he got the world title over in Istanbul this year. He's number one at 106, but bumping up to take on number one Christian Castillo at 113. Ladies and gentlemen, wearing the red from Arizona. He is a U17 world silver medalist. Also ranked number one, ladies and gentlemen, Christian Castillo. Now, I didn't know that Castillo was out to, allowed to wrestle without the mullet. I, yeah, we don't see it very often. What but kind of operation are you running here, Bray? We want to see the mullet. I should have had it in writing, but uh, he did come out to Laffy Taffy again. Yeah. <laughs> At least there's that. Underway, Christian Castillo in the red, Paul Kinney in the black, number one versus number one. A little overtie attempt there. Level change fake from Castillo. These guys were U17 world team teammates this year. Kenny with the gold medal. Castillo did not medal, but he was a silver medalist in 2022 at the U17 world championships. Castillo's second appearance at who's number one. Wrestled against Anthony Knox last year. Now a nice little throw by there off that two on one. Big Matt return, but Granby wants to get the call. There's no longer that in, no reaction time takedown from that position. So that a year ago would be two or three, I should say. Now it's nothing. Anthony Ashnault in Kenny's corner and oh wow, Kenny nice in a shot. shot. These guys are letting it fly early on. Head inside now, but looking really comfortable in that position is, is Castillo. Now they're towards the edge once again. He's got him set down, but now draped over the top. Castillo's safe there, gonna be tough for Kenny to finish. Now hopping over looking for far ankle is Christian Castillo trying to kick his ankles out so he could counter score. Kenny trying to hang on, now he's in good position. That should be, ooh. And what's gonna be the call? They're gonna say action, no points. So two near scores, one for each wrestler, but 0-0 on the scoreboard, but I'm loving this opening pace. 100%, and the thing that Ashnault told me about Kenny is that he's he's hard to score on because he, he bends weird and everybody that wrestles with him says like I can't explain it this guy's body bends in strange ways and he's just very difficult to score on forehead to forehead they go back to that two on one is Castillo he was able to nearly score from this tie controlling the head though is Paul Kinney Still in that two on one. Castillo now lets it go. A minute to go here in the first period. Castillo probably best known for his freestyle accomplishments, but a Super 32 champ a year ago as well. So no slouch in folk style. Winning the most prestigious folk style tournament there is at the high school level. The after quadrangular? Yes. Good fakes there from Paul Kenny. Can't generate. My understanding is in a simulation match at a U17 camp. Castillo won, but in close fashion, and Kenny believes he's right there. Ooh. Oh, nice elbow control right to the attack. Looks to step and trip, thinks better of it, and brings him to the edge. I couldn't tell if Kenny brought him to the edge. Did it not seem like it? It did seem like it. But did he forget? Castillo did a great job yeah. kicking and straightening that oh, leg. We're getting smacky. Kenny may be a little frustrated after that Matador action with Castillo and Castillo doing the Vito Arujo smell the hand trick so at well, the end of the period. Forehead to the second. Kenny's choice. 
He defers to Castillo. He's gonna go under, adamant. Authoritatively, gonna go under, try to get away, get on the board first. If you're gonna have a first period with no points, you want it to look about like that. Totally agree. Lining up on that right side, Kenny now up to his feet. He's Christian Castillo now on the edge, dropping down the leg is Paul Kenny, and they'll have a five second restart. Kenny has yet to wrestle high school, which also means hasn't wrestled a lot of six minute matches, let alone seven minute matches. We'll see if that becomes a factor. Dropping down to the leg again. Tries to double off, but can't. And the count stops when you come back to your feet. And they'll go out of bounds again, 23 seconds. Tick off. It does feel a little bit like Kenny still kind of conditioned to wrestle the edge like it's freestyle. That's kind of where my mind went when he kind of drove him towards the edge. And now Castillo going to get away. He'll take a 1-0 lead. Ryan Tom not a factor at this point. Kenny notches 28 seconds. I'd love to see these guys fire off another attack like we saw in the first. Good fakes there from Castillo. Level change and then Kenny nearly darts in and counter. Throw by attempt from Castillo fails. Minute to go here in the second. Underhook Castillo, Kenny with that head position. Now double unders towards the edge. Tell Kenny not super comfortable in this tie, would like to clear out. He's gonna back out. That's gonna be a stall warning against Kenny. Savvy there from Castillo. Yeah, he could sure. tell. He could tell he had that position and just took him out of bounds. Castillo controlling that wrist, so when Kenny looks to fire, not able to get to that. Single leg position, 30 seconds to go. Castillo from Valiant Prep in Arizona, and I can see plenty of Arizona State coaches represented here in the building, and they're watching closely. Castillo uncommitted, but I know ASU would love to have him. 10 seconds to go. Castillo continued to hold center pretty well. And driving Kenny towards the edge, but Kenny is up on the shot right as time expires. We're going to go into the third, 1-0. Kenny going to go underneath. This could be a big test for Paul. We'll see how assertive Castillo is from the top position. That last snap on the edge for Castillo, you almost got the impression he was just trying to, you know, go big brother on him a little bit, maybe more than score points. Kenny does a good job, comes up and out right away. Knotted at one, riding time not a factor. Gonna settle this one on the feet in all likelihood. It's a shot attempt by Kenny. He's been favoring that left side attack. Neither guy able to score so far. You'd say Edge Castillo, but Kenny's been on a nice attack himself. Couple of them. Yeah, good fakes there by Castillo. Disrupting a little bit of Kenny's timing there. There's a minute 12 to go. Is the hand fight of Castillo really preventing a lot of offensive options for Paul Kenny? And now shoves him out of bounds. And it's just an action call on the edge. Castillo close to dragging that foot, but did go out momentarily. One minute to go. Let's see what Paul Kenny has planned for this final, final minute of action here. It's been Castillo a little bit in the in the driver's seat here, dictating pace. See if he fires an attack. You see, he's trying to get those stutter fakes going. And there he gets behind. Rear standing position. Nothing yet. That's close. Hopping over and sliding that foot through. And they're going to go out of bounds. The foot is 
off the mat completely. Man, these guys need a bigger mat. Paul Kenny's reputation of being tough to score on, bearing true in that situation, man. No doubt Castillo's been all the way behind him twice. Super duck attempt. Not there, 18 seconds to go now. We'll be headed to overtime, sudden victory. Wrist control there for Paul Kenny, ear to ear, not a lot of offense going on there. Double change on that high crotch for Kenny, but not in shallow penetration, and time's gonna run out in regulation. First overtime match of the evening. Two minutes on the board. Riding time wiped. Any score here ends it. Kenny does have a stall warning, so that's gotta be in the back of his mind, especially in edge situations. That last, I don't know, 30 seconds of the period kind of belonged to Kenny after he defended that takedown. We'll see if he can ride that momentum here in OT. Their exchanges have been fun when they've attacked, and now look for the goal line. That's gonna be free. Christian Castillo, a 4-1 winner in overtime. Third time's a charm. Able to run behind to the right. Gets the takedown, and it will remain number one. Yeah, Castillo. Christian. So dangerous with an angle like that. Speed kills, and he used it there. And it got started with that rear standing situation, a standing Granby from Paul Kenny. And they ended up in a lot of exciting flurries here. And it took more than just seven minutes to separate these two, and it was a go behind from Christian Castillo that ultimately got it done. Here's the second time, and just hopping that foot through. Good win for Castillo, but Paul Kenny, a lot of fun to watch for years to come. Coming up next, 132 pounds, it's gonna be Ben DeVino and Kyler Larkin. Coming out wearing the black from the state of Arizona, he is a U-17 world team member, currently ranked number two, ladies and gentlemen, Kyler Larkin. Miles Morales, the black Spider-Man uh, in this in this gear. So we'll see if he wrestles like it. All right, let's find out. And we're in the red from Illinois. A U-17 world team member, currently ranked number one, Ben Davino. Here comes Number one, Ben DeVino, Ohio State commit. I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. And a reminder, if you are watching on YouTube, this is the last match that's gonna be available for free. Head over to flowwrestling.org after this one. And underway, 132 pounds. And right away, Ben DeVino, number one in the country, in the red, on a single leg against Kyler Larkin in the black, looking to jump out to a 3-0 lead early here. He's got a treetop. Finishes, almost, got him on the hip, and there's a takedown, tone set by Ben Davino. 3-0 lead, Davino, and we knew the attack rate for Davino was gonna be super high. Kyler Larkin with some of the freakiest counter offense around, but Davino, no problem on that first attack. Neither guy afraid to mix it up, but it's Davino starting the evening, starting this match with a 3-0 lead off that single leg takedown. And able to finish a position that's give, been giving a lot of people trouble so far tonight, that standing single leg. Yeah, Davino has wrestled a pace like this for years and continues to add to his skills. And now nice mat return. That was really nice. 25 seconds of riding time already for Davino. Half on that left side, riding with some forward pressure out on his toes. Larkin have a hard time creating that hip separation. But now up to his feet, and Davino gonna kick. Escape Kyler Larkin, 3-1 on the scoreboard. Larkin out, avoids the one minute riding time advantage. Larkin from Valiant Prep in Arizona, just like Christian Castillo, who we just watched. Ben Davino from St. Charles East in Illinois, just about an hour away, north of Chicago. Good head position there for 
Larkin, but now ends up more ear to ear as they clear out 90 seconds to go here in the first period. Davino second time wrestling at who's number one. Got a big win last year over Mark Anthony McGowan. Flipped the result from a Ironman final the previous year. Pretty much held on to number one at 126 the rest of the year until he moved up to 132 and look at that. Another shot there, but this time it's defended by Kyler Larkin. Oh, little shuck by off the head. Granby roll by Kyler Larkin evading. Now we're scrambling on the edge of the mat. When Larkin locks on this crotch, he's super dangerous. He's got a lot of ways to finish in here, but on the edge, I don't know if we're gonna see it. Gonna be tough now. Switching head inside is Ben Davino. That makes it a little bit tougher for Larkin. Now he's coming up. Both guys really actively working to score from this position, but they're on the edge and now flattened out. That'll be a stalemate back to center they go. That's and one of those where a strategic guy can work to score and knows also if, if it starts to be disadvantageous for them, they can just go right out of bounds. Third takedown tonight, we've seen a guy get to rear standing and his opponent able to fight out of it and avoid giving up that three-point takedown. Twelve seconds left in the period. We'll see if there's another attack or if we just go to the second 3-1. And that's how the first will end. 3-1 lead for Ben Davino out of Illinois. Coin flip Larkin. He's going to defer, and so we'll see Davino go underneath. Larkin going to get a crack from the top position here. Davino turtles up looking for hands. He's got one. Now locked. Briefly was Larkin. He's up to his feet. Looking for a return is Kyler Larkin. Good return. Was briefly half right side and switches claw. Back up to his feet is Ben Davino. Larkin mentioned that, oh, there we go, he's out. I was gonna say, Larkin mentioned that he's preferred freestyle. Valiant prep schedule has lent itself more towards freestyle, but showing some folk style top skills there. Of course, his dad, Eric Larkin, Hodge Trophy winner for Arizona State. Good motion there from Larkin. Using heavy hands and fakes. Trying to get Defino off balance any way he can, but he has not fired. There's some good level changes. We need to follow those up though. Oh, oh wow. nice re-attack there by Ben Davino. Good position on this single leg. He's back standing, trying to pull Larkin back to center. Larkin posting on the head. Gonna make it tough. Davino was able to solve this puzzle last time, but now with the edge as a factor, could be a little bit tougher. Now Larkin trying to counter score. He's out front and that's gonna be it for that exchange as they go back to center. 4-1 lead still for Davino, 21 to go in the second. If you don't finish on Larkin quickly, things get better and better for Kyler Larkin. Five seconds left and the situation now for Larkin is he, he may not be able to count on another committed attack from Davino. He may have to go get one of his own. He's got to get out first, though. We saw Davino ride him for 44 seconds in the first period. Larkin chooses bottom. And we're underway in the third period. 4-1 lead for Ben Davino. Claw on that right side for Davino. Up to his feet is Kyler Larkin. And he's away. 4-2 the score. There's a shot for Larkin, but right into Davino's reattack series. Now just out front, Mantis position. 4-2 score, but reminder, three-point takedown, so 
Larkin in a position to take the lead if he can get a takedown. Hand fighting in the center. Larkin needs to generate. Oh, look at pass by, not there. Off that elbow control. Larkin taking some ground in this third Single period. leg, now. deep position. Now looking to come out the back doors. Kyler Larkin locked between the legs there is Ben DeVino. This is Larkin's best attack so far. Can he out scramble? Feeding him some hips here, but that reverse lock is strong for Ben DeVino. That's a good position to hang out in. We'll see if DeVino works the score or just hang on. Looks like stalemate is the move, and Larkin, no answers from that position. So up, 30 seconds. Try to get one takedown. Single leg, really nice attack from Larkin. We'll see if he goes back to that. He may need to. He can't. Davino not likely to beat himself. He's gonna have to go get it. Dives for the far leg. Good head hands from Ben Davino, keeping him away. Not even letting him get to a lock. 10 seconds to go. Larkin picking up his pace. Good sprawl off the single leg from Ben Davino. He's got Larkin on the edge with three seconds to go. And for the second year in a row, Ben Davino wins at who's number one, and he'll maintain his number one ranking. Great match there, incredible clash of styles, and it's Ben DeVino with the hand raise. Buckeyes getting a good one. And there's that first single leg. This is the deciding takedown here. Tree tops it, lifts that leg up, gets the three. Some nice exchanges in the rest of it, but uh, in the end, it was Davino on the strength of that takedown. And coming up next, we got 126 pounds. It's a rematch. It's Jax Forrest taking on Jordan Rainey. Whoa. Ladies and gentlemen, coming out wearing the black. He is a U17 Greco World Gold Medalist from Kentucky. Currently ranked number four. Give it up for Jordan Rainey. Right, here we go. This is one of the most dangerous wrestlers in all of high school wrestling, regardless of weight classes. Jordan Rainey. He put that dangerous style on display in the Greco U17 Championships. And wearing the red, he is a U17 World Silver Medalist from Pennsylvania, currently ranked number one, ladies and gentlemen, Jax Forrest. Here we go, Jax Forrest coming to the mat. He had one of the craziest matches of who's number one last year with Nate Jezaroga, and now gonna run it back with the ever dangerous Jordan Rainey. Funky town, baby. Great tune, and we are now underway in the red. That's Jax Forrest and the black Jordan Rainey. This is a rematch from Super 32. Forrest ran out to a really big lead in that one, and it was Rainey with a Oof. pin. Oof. Almost hits that slide by, but good job by Forrest finding his way to a single leg. Familiar position for him. He's great in the finishes, but diving under is Jordan Rainey. Nothing yet. And Rainey looking to counter score. He's not in a bad position, but Forrest going to be able to potentially improve his position, but sitting through there is Jordan Rainey. Could he come away with the opening takedown? What a first flurry of this match. That's a takedown for Rainey. Three points. In, in his interview yesterday, Rainey said, yeah, I got the win last time, but I want to win the beginning of the match. I don't want to be down by 11 points and have to get a pin. And there's Forrest with a reversal, but normally this would be tied a year ago. Now, Rainey with a 3-2 lead. Remember, that three-point takedown is huge. But being under Jax Forrest, not a fun position. This is a guy with college wins, college turns. He had a bunch of opens last year as a freshman in high school. Unbelievable. Yeah, Whoa, oh look at that throw gosh. by. Ridiculous. Three more on the board, but it's Forrest taking the 5-4 lead. I have a feeling I'm going to be watching that one on social media later tonight. That's as pretty as it gets, and he's looking for a turn. What a great opening period. Already nine points on the board. Forrest has collected 25 seconds of riding time. 
And Jax isn't one of those guys that's going to try to wrestle a, a tactical, controlled match and win one takedown. And neither is Rainey, frankly. No. Both guys just let it fly, take risks, and see who's winning at the end of the match. Yeah, a lot of the other athletes in the event said this was the match they were looking forward to the most. And this is why. Escape here, paramount for Rainey, but getting a, not turned here, even more important, holding two is the official. Wrestling back in is Rainey. He's gonna get an escape, but not before giving up two near fall on the turn. 7-5, David Bray. I wondered if we might see that three count come into effect, but just the two, and oh, oh my wow. gosh. A little short drag kind of position, I think. He's gonna come away with three more. 10-5 already. Now looking like a bottom leg cradle. You see the arm length of Forrest coming into play there, but Rainey able to avoid it, going to his back at least for the time being. Crazy length for Jax Forrest and also freaky leverage. I think he's a lot stronger than he looks. You mentioned earlier college wins. This guy, I believe 12 and two against division one opponents last year as a freshman in high school, including a win over current number seven ranked Brett Unger. Oh, oh look at high flyer, very dangerous from Rainey, but almost frees himself, but not quite. Hard wizard now looking to kick out and big escape there for Rainey. 10, six now the score. 122 of riding time for Forrest. Just a casual 16 points on the board here in the first period. And not only is Rainey going to keep wrestling, but he's going to keep going for knockout punches like that. All right, we'll head to the second. 10-6 on the scoreboard. It's going to be Forrest Choice. He's going to go underneath. Our producers had a lot of highlights to choose from here in between periods. Indeed they do. And now Rainey lining up on top left side, and we are underway. Granby roll here. And can he get this Peterson? Force is looking for it, nothing yet. It's getting close. Weird exchange here. Forrest now switches his tactic, hooks that ankle, trying to pop his head out. He's close to a reversal, and that's what he's gonna get. Two more for Jax Forrest. This guy cannot stop scoring points, and now it's 12-7 after the Jordan Rainey escape. Riding time still intact, 103. Oh, and there's two, three, excuse me, for Jordan Rainey. Gets a dirty takedown of his own. Yeah, some oohs and ahs in the crowd there. It's 12-10, minute 14 left in, just in the second period. It's an incredible match. Nice lift and return there from Jordan Rainey. And getting a ride out here could be huge for him, but it's still another minute. But at the very least, he has taken a bite out of that riding time. Jordan Rainey, known for his comeback wins. U17 Greco semis against Iran. Go watch it, insane comeback for this guy. And he's never gonna stop, 55 seconds left in the second. <laughs> Forrest reaches back for that wizard. Not a lot between these two guys is gonna look super conventional. Not at all, and Forrest nearly in a position where he could escape. And now body lock here, this is a Greco position. Rainey's gonna be dangerous here, looks to put him down. Just able to get the return, a very important return. But that is that was a, a near fall potential from that body lock. And for Rainey, if he's got near fall potential, he has fall potential. This guy puts people away. And just like that, it's 12 to 10, 24 seconds to go, and at this point, Jordan Ray has decided I'm finishing this period on top. That is my goal here. Granby roll, he's close again, but this time Rainey does a better job of following. Falling the hips, almost catches him on his back. Drops down to the leg. 10 seconds to go in the second period. Incredible match so far. We still have a period to go, David, as Rainey's gonna keep that toe in. Savvy edge wrestling, 12-10, we head to the third. Rainey immediately signals bottom. And Jax Forrest, part of match of the night a year ago. Right now, looking like he's part of match of the night again. No doubt about it. Rainey goes under, had a little smirk on his face. Got to be having a great time. 
Although he's in the heat of battle, it's a one-point match, David. 12-11 after that rainy escape. And you have to wonder, this is the first match where I feel like both guys have wrestled seven minutes. Could pace become a factor as Rainey's in on a single leg, countering is Jax Forrest. Rainey almost stepped in for that takedown. Crazy counter there for Forrest. Good feel, and they're on the edge. And now it's Forrest in on a shot. He's going to get the three-point takedown on the edge. Huge takedown, 15-11, 90 seconds to go. This match is insane. Totally 20, crazy. 26 second, or 26 points up on the board. Now Rainey's got to get away in the same fashion he did to start this period. He's up to his feet right away. And looking to roll. You can see why Rainey is so dangerous. Looking to put guys on their back from every position. Boot in. But the foot on the outside, not ideal. And now Rainey's got his leg underneath. He's got his body cradle. And now switches a head outside on the finish. Locked around the crotch. Forrest still on top wow, here. good job by Jax Forrest. Maintaining control and he slips a boot in now. A near side cradle potentially. Far side, I should say. And that's gonna be an escape for Rainey. Now he's gonna go in. Should be tied. 15-15. Scores wrong. It's a tie it match. It is tied. 35 seconds to go. 15-15. 33 to go. This crowd is loving it. People coming to their feet. No quit. Neither one of these guys. Rainey, can he get a ride out to send this to OT? 33 seconds left in the third. He was able to ride tough in the second period. Drops down to the ankles, gotta let go, and does. Looking for a changeover is Jax Forrest. Rainey staying behind the arms, 24 seconds to go. Granby roll for Jax Forrest, gotta be careful, he's coming around. Rainey able to drop down to the leg, should that be a count, I don't know. But Rainey able to fight in. Forrest has to be and careful, careful. He's, back. Back. he's gotta be careful. As Jax Forrest, he wants his escape almost too bad, looking for a tilt maybe. Forrest running away, they go out of bounds, five seconds. We're gonna have a restart. Jax will have one last attempt, and this is gonna go to overtime. Rainey's corner complaining about something. We got five seconds to go in regulation. Rainey lines up right side, drops down to the ankle. He can afford to do so. Trips, roll again for Forrest. He's so tricky with his hips. Coming around, nothing, nothing there. We're going to overtime. Two minutes on the board. Riding time clears. Oh my gosh. Here we go, first point score. Rainey taking ground. Collar tie for Rainey. Towards the edge, looking for that throw by on, on the attack, but they're on the edge. Sprawl from Jax Forrest. They'll go out of bounds. 144 to go in sudden victory. As David mentioned, any point is the difference. Oh, tries to jump it. A little Kurt McHenry action there. No argument for Forrest. He gave a thumbs up to the official. And a little pass by. He's got it because he gave the two. There's a takedown. Jack Forrest does it. Gets three. Match of the night. Match of who's number one. 18-15. Crowd on their feet. Both guys absolutely delivered. Jax Forrest and Jordan Rainey, thank you for 33 points. Incredible. Unbelievable. Both guys so good, so dangerous. That's what you want to see. That's what makes wrestling such a great sport. No tactics, just try to score. Just this try to highlight score. might be the entire eight minutes of wrestling. Yeah, good luck. Oh my gosh. My heart's racing from that one. Uh, seriously. I was running out of words. I was getting flustered. It was just too good. Incredible action. Both guys. They should just wrestle who's number one every year regardless, even when they're in college. Just, yeah. Let's just continue. What a match. So much fun to watch. And man, Jax Forrest on the edge. Just, yeah, insane. Both these guys, just sophomores. We're going to be watching these guys what? for years to come. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Who's number one is sponsored by Dolomer, the official mat of Flow Sports. All Flow Wrestling events, including tonight's, will be wrestled on Dolomer mats, the undisputed in sports surfaces. Coming up next, 220 pounds, Cody Merrill and Sawyer Bartle. Ladies and gentlemen, now coming out, we're in the black. He is a U-20 Greco World Team member from Florida, currently ranked number two. Ladies and gentlemen, Sawyer Bardo. Here comes Sawyer Bardo from Florida, skipping a high school football game to be here. But you know what? You got the number one spot on the line. Might as well. Might as well. Thank you, Sawyer. Ladies and gentlemen, in the red, he is a two-time Fargo champion. From California, currently ranked number one, this is Cody Merrill. Here comes Cody Merrill. And uh, the most tranquil of walkout songs we've had tonight. <laughs> Very zen. Cody Merrill just up with a guy that split matches with him a year ago. Cody Merrill, anything but tranquil on the mat. No. There's that snap right to the leg. We saw him do this all far go long, and he's pick up right where he left off in North Dakota. Nice roll attempt from Sawyer Bartle, but it's Merrill coming out on top, 3-0, to get this one started. Running that half with a lot of force. It's going to be tough to turn Bartle here, but taking out on his neck a little bit. The power Cody Merrill possesses is so impressive. His ability to snap, drop in on the leg. We saw him do that in the Fargo Finals. Gets a very tough Cole Mirasola, whose brother Connor's gonna be wrestling in the main event tonight. Underhook on that right side for Sawyer Bartle. The last two matches these guys wrestled were at the U17 Trials last year. One was freestyle, one was Greco. Both were criteria matches, one for each guy. Both ended with coaches on the mat challenging. <laughs> Merrill, one of the, the top uncommitted wrestlers in his class. A lot of teams super interested in getting him on their wrestling team. He could be a difference maker. Looks to project at one, 197, that's the thought. Yeah, talking with him yesterday, it sounds like that's, you know, mostly the plan, probably the plan. And Bartle, Committed to Iowa State, gonna be a cyclone. So after that opening takedown, slower pace from Cody Merrill. A little level change there from Sawyer Bartle. Not there though. Good shot there, head outside for Merrill. Drops him down, that was textbook. It could be getting some swipes out of the deal, but Bartle able to recover. It's gonna make it 6-1. Cody Merrill in the driver's seat here. A Couple years ago, the criticism, if any, of Merrill was, you know, this guy's very positionally solid, but needs to attack more. He has certainly done that in the last year, last couple of tournaments. And they go out of bounds, restart coming, 29 to go here in the first period. 6-1 lead for Cody Merrill. Talking with Cody Merrill yesterday and his teammate Daniel Zapeta. They've, they've both got their eyes on three-point takedowns helping him to text. That's, that's how they're thinking about this. He's on his way, he's up five already. Great high crotch there, perfect head position. Neck tight there and gets the finish, no problem. Riding time nearing a minute for Merrill. And Bartle tries to fight up right away off the whistle, but good forward pressure by Cody Merrill. 22 seconds, you can 
assume Merrill does not want to give up an escape at the end of the first period. And riding with that in mind, 14 seconds up to his feet is Sawyer. Trying to get hands out to the side is Cody Merrill now. And one last return. Gonna yield a ride out for Cody Merrill. Finishing that period on top, so important. 6-1 Merrill after one. Really nice effort there to finish on top, not only preserving the point, but also pushing riding time to a minute 21. And now if he can get out in 21 seconds, he'll maintain that advantage. And they jump sides there to Bartle. Trying to pull him back, but nothing there. Granby roll here from Cody Merrill creates a little separation. He gets the escape. 7-1 now the lead, and he maintains that riding time advantage of 110. So all things looking great for Cody Merrill. And there he snaps that head, goes good head position on that single leg. Now head outside, and another finish for three more. 10-1 on the scoreboard, riding time at 117 and climbing. He's got a bar briefly cleared out by Sawyer Bartle. Absolutely dominant performance so far by Seriously. Merrill and made to look even more dominant now with his three-point takedown. And I think that's part of the intention of the rule. If there's separation between guys, you know, that should be rewarded. Still can't believe we just had a 33-point match. <laughs> we got 11 in a 220 match yeah. already. Now 12. One guy's hogging all of them right now. That's Cody Merrill. Huge advantage at this point. And Sawyer trying to create some offense. Merrill was injured for most of the 2022-23 season. Came back for Fargo. And you know what? He's been a point hog ever since he's been back. <laughs> yeah. Not a big sharer. 25 remaining here in the second period. Thirteen seconds to go. Another level change there from Bartle. Short time left. We'll head to the third period. And we're going to go neutral. Merrill trying to influence Bartle's decision. Let's go neutral. Sawyer Bartle from South Dade, Florida. Cody Merrill Gilroy competes with coach Daniel Cormier. See if Merrill pushes to extend that lead. Effectively up nine points right now with riding time likely coming. Sweep single this time. Bartle able to defend hard club and underhook. Shot looking reattacks Bartle, not there. Cody Merrill had extremely high recruiting stock coming into this event. Gotta imagine that's only gone up. Only going up. Looks like a guy that, you know, if you don't want a red shirt, looks like the guy that could physically endure some of the, the rigor of Division I wrestling for sure. 54 seconds to go. No sign of tiring either from Cody Merrill. If anything, it's Bartle. It's kind of breaking position a little bit more. As I say that, fires that underhook. But remember, Merrill's just got an answer for everything. He does. Remember Bartle, U20 Greco World Team member. His hand fight has gotten a lot better, but wow. man, it doesn't matter. Merrill Near looking whew, close to the cradle. Another great go behind from Cody Merrill. Continues to add to his lead. 13-2, riding times lock effectively 14-2. about as dominant as we've seen anyone tonight, David. 100%. First bonus point victory here on the boys' card. And an escape at the end here. Five seconds remaining. And Sawyer going to concede. 
And Sawyer gonna extend the hand first. That's normally Cody's move. Yes. And that's gonna do it. 14 to three, the final. Cody Merrill, number one. Defends that number one spot. Cody Merrill, ultra impressive. And I think big things will continue to come for him. That's the takedown that got it all started. And then this high crotch, look at that head position. Beautiful. Man, it is well with my soul. You know, this, this music's got me very feeling at peace. Yeah, bringing my heart rate down a little bit after yeah. that 126 match, which I needed. I'm still sweating uncontrollably, but that's okay. What's next, David? 138 pounds coming up next. Merrill's teammate, Daniel Zapata, he's taking on Bo Bassett. Ladies and gentlemen, wearing the black from Pennsylvania, he is a U-17 world gold medalist. Currently ranked number two. Give it up for Bo Bassett. Here comes Bo Bassett coming out to Johnny Cash and up this year. Was it 55 kilos the last we saw him? He's grown, yeah. he's 138. Here he is looking for the number one spot. And wearing the red, he is a Fargo finalist from California. Currently ranked number one, ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Zapata. First look at Daniel Zapata comes out slapping hands. This guy is a showman and He's ready to defend his number one spot. Quite a style clash here. So much intrigue for this match. We are underway right away. The fur is flying and it's Daniel Zapata on attack. But just as I say that, Bo Bassett trying to fight in. No two yet as Bo is fighting through this position. And working on this single leg. Now head outside is Daniel Zapata. No score. Shin Wizard there for, for Bassett. Looks cut through. And now he's in position to score. Foot in the air. Diving around. And coming around is Bo Bassett, still nothing. He's on that single leg above the knee now. Good position for Bo Bassett. He limp arms out, but it's Daniel Zapata catching the leg, trying to roll him through is Bo Bassett, but it's Daniel Zapata's gonna settle in for the three-point takedown. What, what a start. What an opening 40 seconds of that match. Great sequence. And Zapata on top. Bassett fighting hands underneath. Reaching back, grabbing that head. Gotta be careful, nearly on his back, one. Two, and this is big trouble for Bo Bassett. What's gonna be the call? Three near fall there. That's new as well. So you can get two near fall, three near fall, or four near fall now. And a little unconventional bottom attempt there from Bo Bassett, and just like that, 6-0 out the gate. Yeah, Bassett sold out there on bottom and it didn't pay off, and now fighting the head. He's up to his feet, and there's the point, 6-1. 6-1, but Bo's pace is a real thing, but can it be a thing against Daniel Zapata? He's gonna get an easy go behind here, making a 6-4, and he's already kicking him. Bassett known for his pace, and there's a hard snap Zapata, though. Snapped him into his leg, gotta be careful there. And now looking to score, neutral danger zone potential here for Bo Bassett, or for Zapata, he's gonna take him through. And now Bo potentially looking for exposure, but it's Zapata in decent position between the legs. Now going to try to pass maybe as Bo Bassett, but in a better position as Daniel Zapata as Bo collects far ankle. And could we see another takedown here for Daniel Zapata? He's certainly in position to do so. Can, he, can Bo pass this leg here? Close again to neutral danger. A couple of swipes Enough. now. Ooh, nice job. Good adjustment. And now for the time being, Bo may be out of danger between the legs here, but Zapata continuing to look to score. And the question is, can these guys maintain this pace? I mean, they've wrestled two minutes and 20 seconds the entire time in very, very taxing exchanges for most wrestlers. And it's 7-4 Zepeda. Looking at the body language, you believe Bassett likes this pace. But it's Zepeda finding his way into an egg leg a little too easily, you would say. And now looking to finish, but sprawling back is Bo Bassett. Remember, Bassett hasn't lost a folk style match in over a year. Wrestled at who's number one as an eighth grader against Seth Mendoza. Now back. Wrestling at who's number one up at 138. Now looking great reattack here 
from Bo Bassett trying to double off but Zepeda threatening a little bit with a, a high flyer now crackdown position and Zepeda looking to counter but it's Bo Bassett getting some height and can he score here at the end? I think that's three. Are they gonna get it? And they're saying no, man. I thought he, maybe not. No challenge coming from Bassett's corner. No brick, but what a first period. And Bassett gonna go underneath. He gave up three near fall. Last time he was underneath, but undeterred, gonna go under once again. I'm still thinking about that last sequence and wondered if you might see a challenge, but Jody Stripmatter right away said, no, let's just wrestle. Yeah, with, with pace being a factor, that's important. Now look at Suck back there is Zapeda and Bo finds his way to a leg, now pulling it up, potentially working for a reversal. Locking around the crotch is Zepeda, nothing yet, and riding time climbing here for Daniel Zepeda. And but potentially countering here is Bo Bassett. This is a dangerous position. Can he get near fall? But no, just the reversal for two. Seven six on the scoreboard. And is he gonna look to ride here? Looks like he was thinking about kicking him. And he does. Eight six, riding time over a minute for Zepeda, who shoots deep single leg position here for Daniel Zepeda. Now can he come out the back door? Bassett feeding him a little bit of hips. We've and now head outside for Zepeda. We've seen that Bassett snap result a couple times in Zepeda on a leg. And now good. Bassett, good angle. He's stepping over that ankle, but not able to score it as of yet. Now diving under, and Zepeda in good position to potentially score here, but Bassett has that ankle. Does he have the power to pass it though? That's the question. And Zepeda in position to get another takedown. But look at Bose scooting in, scooting in. Hoping for a stalemate as he looks up. And he might just get it, 25 seconds to go. Zepeda still with that leg hooked. If he can hip in, he may get the takedown, but weird position, they're gonna get the three. Yeah. Takedown. 11-6 now, 10 seconds remaining. With that leg split, it's gonna be tough for Bassett to get out, although now, Hips down, Zepeda though gets a leg in. Zepeda gonna have choice going into the third. And one thing I thought would be maybe more of a factor, at least we'd see more effort from Bo, is the top position. But as of right now, top has not been a factor for Bo. It's Zepeda with the lone turn and riding time. And Bo looks at his corner and wants to go optional. If this goes to the feet, he's gotta be careful with those snaps. He Kip. does, and there's the escape, 12-6 plus riding time. And there's another attempt from Bo Bassett. The three-point takedowns, he's, he's gonna need like three of them. Yeah, absolutely, and or riding a take time. takedown and a turn. He's been in some positions to potentially threaten a turn. Both First. athletes holding up well, don't seem to be Feeling any signs of fatigue as it's a great reattack. Is Zepeda going to add to his lead? 15 to 6 now. A minute 20 to go. And now Bassett able to escape, but it's 15 7 on the scoreboard. Almost desperation time here as once again the head hands getting challenged from Bo Bassett as Zepeda free access to Bo's legs and looking to finish here again. And Bo trying to roll him through but not gonna be able to do so. And now potential bottom leg cradle here, maybe. But no, finding that foot is Bo Bassett. Close to neutral danger. I think Zepeda may score this. And there's three more for Zepeda, 18 to seven, plus near fall, blowing this match out. Near fall, could he get the pin here? Zepeda working to settle in. The ref holding four near fall, so 12-7. And there's the pin, Daniel Zepeda. Sending a message here, and he is fired up. Gilroy and Daniel Cormier are going 2-0 here, and who's number one? 2-0 and, oh and two dominant victories for the Gilroy boys, and great performance from Daniel Zepeda.
And Bo had some flurries there, had some moments, but Daniel Zepeda had way, way, way too much for Bo Bassett at the end of the day. Great performance by him. He was able to generate offense. He was able to counter score. He was able to turn. He was able to pin. That's the name of the game. If you can do all those things, you're going to win a lot of matches. That's what Daniel Zepeda just did. And he was able to wrestle the same pace as Bassett. And that's always been a differentiator. Not this time. Great performance there from Zepeda. Man, there was that opportunity Bassett had. It was like he might get something there, but anyway, hey, coming up next, oh my gosh, Anthony Knox, Leo DeLuca. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in the black. Coming out, he is a two-time Fargo champion from New Jersey, currently ranked number two, Leo DeLuca. Here we go, Leo DeLuca coming to the mat. 120 pounds, number two, Blair Academy. And he's been preparing for the last month and change to wrestle one of his very best friends on the planet. A little Tupac, that's a good start for Leo. And we're in the red from New Jersey. He is a 16U Fargo champion, currently ranked number one, ladies and gentlemen, Anthony Knox. There's a reason this is the co-main event. So much excitement, not just because these two are training partners and good friends, uh, two outstanding and entertaining wrestlers. Leo dominated a very good field at Fargo this July. Knox, wow, look at that. Right to left on that single leg standing. Looking to dive under is Knox. Leo not able to stop the dive roll. Now it's Knox underneath. Looking to repass the leg is Leo DeLuca, and these two are scrambling right away. And it's Leo DeLuca close to that three, and he's gonna get it. Jumps out to the first takedown, does Leo DeLuca. But now looking switch, fighting in is Anthony Knox. And there's Next. a count going on in the ankle. No, nope. stop counting. And now Knox trying to work for a reversal to get to his preferred position, which is on top. But of course, he can obviously generate from his feet. He can counter score, but it's Leo DeLuca holding position really well. I, answer, I asked Anthony Knox yesterday, when you guys are at your best in the room, what does it look like? He said it looks like a lot of points. Yeah, and that's a, a definitely indicative in that opening scramble. Man, I can't get over that first attack. Right, kind of jabs right and fires left as DeLuca. He's in so deep. See if he continues to ride or maybe kicks Knox free, not wanting to give up that reversal. And, wind up in Anthony's wheelhouse, although there's a quick, he goes chop and then it's a quick escape from Anthony Knox, 3-1 on the scoreboard. Still two minutes left in the first. Over under position there for DeLuca. DeLuca's speed really hard to anticipate, but Knox has felt it. DeLuca's still able to get to that shot earlier. That is some crazy speed. One of the reasons a lot of the coaches are on the other watching side. him. Almost looking for a duck on that right side was DeLuca. Knox able to catch. Club attempt there from Knox. Eyeballing it. Knox looks to have a size advantage here. Yeah, absolutely. He has done some wrestling up at 126. But most recently at 55 kilos, which is a pound and a half away. 120. A lot of wrestling from space so far. Not a ton from the tie. Leo fires again, but looking to maybe look for a goal behind was Knox. Nothing. They're back up on their feet. 52, 52 seconds to go. Good job, DeLuca, controlling that elbow, slowing down the go behind attempt of Knox. He's lethal with those go behinds. And that's the second time he's looked for that like Iranian lat drop from that over under position. Five one out two, five one two outlaws. No, that move as you see, 
Looking for the attack on the edge. Thirty to go from DeLuca. Final 30 seconds of the first period. Looking for that single leg again, not able to get it. And now it's Knox trying to score, but hanging on to that arm was DeLuca and couldn't clear out. So a near score there from Anthony Knox, but not able to get it. So we're coming up on the final five seconds of the first. mentioned earlier a lot of college coaches in the room and eyes are glued on this mat all the big names after both of these guys both guys uncommitted both juniors and a lot of schools would like to get these guys as a package deal at 25 or 33 yeah that worked Leo lines up on the right side Wow, nice return, and Knox was thinking Granby roll, but Leo was ready. Another lift, puts him down. Leo drops, locks in the crotch there. And Leo needs to work to finish, or he's gonna get hit for stalling. Either need to put him down or kick him. And they're gonna give the escape? No. And I think that's the right call there. You gotta turn face and be in bounds. DeLuca didn't have much more time to work before he was hit with a stall call. For so sure. smart getting out of bounds there. Now look at this, riding time, 55 seconds. Coming into this match, you would think mad advantage would favor Knox, but right now, DeLuca close to securing that minute of riding time. Totally agree, but we have not seen Knox from the top position as of yet. And Leo may not have to go there. Leo yeah. having the takedown, he's got the option. He's got riding time, he's got a one point lead here, minute 20, but still a lot of wrestling to be done. A shot, reshot there by Anthony Knox. Picking up his footwork there is DeLuca. Knox was finding a little bit of a rhythm and DeLuca maybe trying to disrupt that. And now finger to the eye, get a fresh start. Knox all good, back to center we go. 48 remaining in the second period. Leah looking for that same attack. Leo fired a lot more leg attacks than Knox to this point. Speed of DeLuca has just made it really hard for Knox to find openings. A little shot attempt there. Good exchange there from Knox, but can't generate anything. Now 13 seconds to go in the second. Oh, <laughs> catches him at the buzzer, but time runs out. And DeLuca is gonna go neutral, not gonna test the waters going underneath, and he's afforded himself that right. Yeah, really savvy tactical decision, and it's that three-point takedown once again, playing a big factor in a match. Knox needs to find his way to his own takedown. And DeLuca continuing to try to create an opening. He fires a double leg there, but Knox able to catch it and they end up in an over under position. For Knox, you're, you're, at this point in the match, you've not been able to get to the legs much. Is it almost a point where it's like, man, do you let him in and try to? counter score to see if that's your way to get get on the board because right now Leo has had all the answers for head hands and Knox not been able to get in yeah that may be the path to victory or at least the path to a chance 
for a takedown. Minute to go. DeLuca is not slowed. His not at all. footwork is it's just so quick throughout. No signs of fading. There's a shot from Anthony Knox. Shallow though. Front headlock for DeLuca as he's gonna get to short offense position. They're gonna go out of bounds. 43 remaining. 103 of riding time for DeLuca. Tight front headlock there. Saw Knox reaching for that leg. He kind of had to let go of it. Shot attempt, but once again caught by DeLuca. 30 seconds to go here. And there's a, a warning against DeLuca and coming up underneath. A little peek out there. Diving under though is DeLuca and gonna get the three plus swipes. Knox is gonna do it in the last 15 seconds of the match. Can you believe it? Unbelievable. Go behind, caught him on his back. Short time left, DeLuca super frustrated. He wrestled a great match, but not to the end. It was Knox in the end going to get it. Unbelievable conclusion there. It looked like DeLuca was gonna do it and then one last flurry. And for Anthony Knox, I mean, he had to come from behind against Marcus Blaze at the U17 Cross, wasn't able to do it, was able to get it done against Leo DeLuca. And honestly, bittersweet to watch two good friends like that. Somebody's gonna win, somebody's gonna lose, but what a show both guys put on. Yeah, I'm sure DeLuca's feeling it right now, losing so late, but no shame in losing to someone as great as Anthony Knox. And he gets, he goes underneath and was able to kind of knee dip under there and get the takedown. Coming up next, 195 pounders. Slow Wrestling's Who's Number One is presented by Cliff King, the original wrestling outfitter. Wrestle with the best with Cliff King. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Your Battle of Wisconsin. Coming out in the black, he is a U-17 World Team member, currently ranked number two. Ladies and gentlemen, your own Aiden Sinclair! Listen to that crowd, people are fired up. Aiden Sinclair coming to that mat, putting on the ankle bands, and he's gonna battle an AWA teammate in just a couple seconds, I can't wait. And wearing the red, he is a two-time Fargo champion, currently ranked number one. Ladies and gentlemen, Wisconsin's own Connor Mirasola! As Connor Mirasola comes to the mat, another Wisconsin boy from not far away. And just like the co-main, very familiar opponents here in the main event. Underway, 195 pounds. Connor Mirasola in the red, in the black, Aiden Sinclair. And the hand fight is underway between these two Wisconsin native and Askren Wrestling Academy teammates. These guys did wrestle about a year ago at the AWA duels. It was Sinclair winning that one 3 2. Shot attempt there by Mirasola, or more of a fake, I should say. There's that drag, one of Sinclair's best attacks, but this time Mirasola able to square out of it. Mirasola seems to get stronger every time you see him. Like that single, but a re-attack there, and now they're on the edge. There's an exchange by Mirasola on the edge. On that single, they'll go out of bounds. Not just Wisconsin people tuning in tonight. Mirasola head to Penn State, and Sinclair going to Missouri after this year. Both Connor and his twin brother Cole committed to wrestle at Penn State. Twin brother Cole in the corner over there with Max Askren. Currently ranked third in the country. Mirasola controlling center right now. Aiden's got a little more of an upright stance. Couple of feints there from Mirasola. Snap, snap. 
Same shot there from, and now it's an underhook on the right side for Aiden Sinclair. Head position for Mirasol is slowing things down on that underhook. Those fakes look to be having good effect for Mirasol. I'm curious to see if he's gonna follow it up with a more committed penetration step. Yeah, you wonder a little bit about the strategy and another one. Good little exchanges here. Both guys respecting the other's defense. 40 seconds to go. The takedown Sinclair used in their last meeting was a really quick finish on a single leg. Given Mirasola's defense, it seems unlikely they'll be able to score that same way this time. Now just 15 remaining. Oh, one way, then the other for Sinclair, but no angle for him as Mirasola able to square up. There's a single leg, but they lose it. Hand fight picks up at the end, and we'll go to the second period, scoreless. Flip goes red, Mirasola's choice. Going underneath, no surprise there. Of course, these guys train at different AWA locations a lot of the time, but it sounds like they train together a couple times a week. Yes, they do, and Mirasola was working with Aiden as he was preparing for the Cadet World, or U17 World Championships just this summer. Now a tripod here for Mirasola, trying to get hands. A little ankle trap there. But kind of in that underhook position is Sinclair, and you think he's probably got to work to finish. Now he drops down to the leg, and he's going to get a return. Riding time at 32 and climbing, but right back up with the quad pod is Mirasola. Nice adjustment there, Mirasola on the edge, but Sinclair drops to a leg. And we've been watching these guys wrestle freestyle for a few months. You forget about how good Sinclair is on top and how many tools he has to keep a guy down. Mirasola gets set. 45 seconds of riding time already for Sinclair, that accumulated pretty quickly. Only one stoppage. And now using that same ankle trap again to great effect is Aiden Sinclair. And now he's gonna slide a leg in. And I was wondering if the mat would be a big factor here. And right now, it feels like it is as Aiden Sinclair putting a really tough ride on Connor Mirasola. Got to be discouraging for Mirasola to be what feels like so close to an escape a few times. And he was. Sinclair just hanging on. Leg in. And only 30 to go. And not one of those matches where we're going out of bounds constantly. So Sinclair racking up this riding time quick. They're going to stalemate that, giving Mirasola probably one last crack to get away here in the second period. See if he can make the most of it. Escape would be huge. All the riding time is something he's going to have to contend with. Up to his feet again, but we know Sinclair's got that ankle trap. And now reaching back and trying to, got to be careful here if you're Mirasola, and he kind of thinks better, but not before eating a pretty serious cross face from Aiden Sinclair. He's gonna ride out here. Really savvy period. Two minutes of riding time for Sinclair as we go to the third. And what's Sinclair gonna do? He's gonna go under. Takes a lap around. It looks like Mirasola gonna go optional. Wants to give himself two full minutes to work for a takedown. Mirasola, tons of fakes in that first period. So goes optional, kicks, and now 
1-0 on the scoreboard, but riding time at 155 for Aiden Sinclair. Connor Mirasol has got some work to do. A little misdirect, nice reattack. Aiden Sinclair, crackdown position here. He's trying to get his knee inside that foot. Now circling all the way around, and there's three for Aiden Sinclair extending his lead. 4-0 plus riding time. And Mirasola in some trouble here. Beautiful counter there from St. Clair. Floats through those positions. And now St. Clair right back to that ride. And this is not how the third period was drawn up for Connor Mirasola. 4-0 lead, riding time locked. Nice figure four ride there by Aiden Sinclair. They're gonna, they're gonna hit Aiden for stalling. Ben Askins like, eh, probably fair enough. You know, and there is an emphasis this year. It's a new rule that seems like it should have been in place for a long time. You gotta make an effort to turn on yeah. top and definitely didn't look like much of an effort to turn there. But riding time is locked. So that point effectively there for Aiden. So you can need a stall warning. And he might kick, yes and he does. So, 5-1, even though it reads 4-1 on the scoreboard, that riding time is coming. There's a little post attack by Mirasola. That was close. That was his best attack so far in this match. And he's trying to pull Aiden off the mat so he can get a restart. There were some very nervous photographers over there during that <laughs> exchange. Understandably so. Around 400 pounds of wrestler coming at you. There's a post attack for Mirasola, but the hips are so heavy from Aiden Sinclair. Now, can he counter score here? He's locked around in that chest lock position. Now they come back up to their feet. 10 seconds to go. Mirasola in big trouble here. Sinclair gonna hand fight, hold position. And that's how this one's gonna end. With riding time, Aiden Sinclair back at number one at 195 pounds. Takes the victory over Conor Mirasola. These guys share an embrace, and there it is. Missouri commit, Aiden Sinclair with the hand raise. Takes over number one. What a performance in this crowd. Letting it, these kids know they appreciate their efforts and their entertainment. Wasn't it? Outstanding who's number one start to finish and seeing these two Wisconsin products put it on the line here and it's Aiden Sinclair's big ride and big takedown that was ultimately the difference. So congratulations to Aiden Sinclair and congratulations to all our winners and a thanks to all the kids for coming out putting on a show both the girls and boys alike. David Bray, what stood out to you tonight? I mean you got to start with 33 points on the board at 126 pounds. Jordan Rainey and Jax Forrest put on just an absolute display of what wrestling looks like when both guys sell out. Yeah, it's hard to say as I, as I think back, this 11 who's number one. I'm not sure I can think of a match that good, that back and forth, where the momentum seemed to shift back and forth. Congrats to Jax Forrest, but thank you so much Jordan Rainey for helping make that match so special. We got to cap it off with two matches at the end between super close friends and Man, that is, a, that is a hard thing for those guys to do, but man, they did it for you guys at home. I hope you enjoyed, because I did. It was, they were incredible matches. Absolutely enjoyed it, and we hope you enjoyed these highlights of some of the best action we saw tonight. And there was plenty of it to choose from. As you see Christian Castillo getting that sudden victory, three-point takedown. It was cool seeing the new rules on display. I don't have a major takeaway from them. There's nothing like, Oh, this stood out really. It was just like, just like we thought, three-point takedown. Tactically, it didn't seem to impact a lot. It was just a lot of hard wrestling. Cody Merrill did a great job. And this was the buzzer beater of all buzzer beaters. Anthony Knox stealing this one late against Leo DeLuca. Incredible evening of wrestling. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Remember, World Championships, Senior World Championships coming up very soon, like two weeks from now. We'll see you then. Thank you so much. For Dave Brown, Christian Piles, good night.